Hi everyone and welcome to Inside Unreal, a weekly show where we learn, explore and celebrate everything Unreal. I'm your host Victor Broden and with me today I have Ryan Smith, Technical Art Director of Gearbox Software and Brian Thomas, Managing Director of Design. And we're here to talk a little bit about Borderlands 3. Yeah. yeah, thanks for having us. Yeah, for sure. I'm super happy you guys came. We've, we've been planning it for a while and now we're actually here um, and we got the editor loaded up. But before we dig into the project, I was just curious a little bit about your history with Gearbox and sort of uh, which was, I guess my first question should be, which was the first Borderlands you guys worked on? Uh, man, I've been with Gearbox for 13 years now. So uh, Borderlands 1 was the first one that I worked on. So I've worked on all the, the core Borderlands franchise series. So 1, 2, and 3. Uh, did a little bit of stuff on pre-sequel, but not a lot. Um, but yeah, been around for a while. I've so been with Gearbox for eight years, and my first title was Borderlands 2. I came in on the tail end of that project, like about three weeks before ship. So I've been working on that. I did all their DLCs for that, uh, pre-sequel, and yeah, Borderlands 3. Did you play Borderlands 1? Uh, yeah, a little bit. I remember playing it with my stepbrother. Oh, God, this was so long ago. This was like 10 <laughs> years ago. Uh, we were playing split screen on it. It's a super cool game. And uh, yeah, when I got the gearbox, I was like, this is going to be so fun to work on these titles. Yeah, it's definitely a well-known franchise. Um, and I know it has changed a lot of people's sort of ideas of what they want in games and what they like. Um, you know, Billion Guns, it's um, might sound violent, but it's definitely a lot of fun. Yeah, yeah, it's super fun. A lot of toilet humor, which yeah. is great. Yeah. <laughs> it's been fun. We just had the 10th uh, the <laughs> anniversary of Borderlands 1 was last year. And okay. you know, when it came out, we were like, it was a hard sell for people to be like, yeah, it's an FPS, but it has RPG mechanics. And mm -hmm. now that's just like de facto. Every mm -hmm. FPS that comes out has RPG mechanics in it at this point. Yeah, it is. And there's definitely, I mean, you. there's even a little bit of pop culture when it comes to like Claptrap and... Mm -hmm. um, I remember playing through 2 before I got hired at Gearbox, and I, I or not playing through because it wasn't out yet, but like when I got there and I was actually playing like the game, just like laughing out loud like so much and remembering that it's like one of the only games that I've ever played that as I was playing it, I was just like laughing really hard at like all the jokes and stuff uh -huh. like that. Uh, so that that to me was always a big selling point. Is like on top of all like the super awesome gun combat and you, you just get like hilarious dialogue and killing psychos and like what they yell out when they die is uh -huh. just always so funny like when you kill one in three he's like uh he says something like uh i wish my child was was born or something like that or tell 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 my child i wish you i wish they were born or something <laughs> like it's just like ridiculous stuff like that it's good stuff um and i remember playing a lot of borderlands one like it was clearly one you know sort of groundbreaking in terms of when it came out um how, how big was the team back then and versus now? Oh man, BL1 dev team, probably around 75 people. Uh, studio was a little larger than that just for operations and QA and, and sort of ancillary roles. Um, but yeah, I mean, it was, it was a pretty small team. It was definitely at that size where it's like you know everybody and everybody's mm -hmm. just wearing lots of hats. Like I was doing cinematics and I was also helping out with like boss designs and one of the other cinematic designers was like building a level uh, and doing like a boss combat arena at the same time like everybody just kind of had two three different roles that you sort of had to put on just because the team was so small uh, so it's been it's crazy now because now we're up to like hundreds of people and we have like a, a studio in Quebec City and our studio in Frisco so mm -hmm. it's like you know the, the scale of it is just so so freaking different than like oh man I had a problem with that I'm gonna walk down the hall and just like hit somebody and be like what's up with this yeah. <laughs> and uh, you guys are both down in Frisco right mm -hmm. yeah and that's your headquarters? Yes. Yeah. So our software, Gearbox Software and uh, Gearbox Publishing is there. And then Gearbox Studio Quebec is in Quebec City. Cool. Well, I think that's enough of, you know, talking. And why don't we just dive into the other? Because I know everyone's pretty excited <coughs> to see this. Yeah, absolutely. So I'm going to be showing you guys our recruitment map and some of the technical stuff that we have developed internally to kind of help along the production of Borderlands 3. So yeah, the first thing you'll see is like this is Borderlands running in the Unreal Engine. Like we haven't really changed the interface too much at all. Uh, the tools have been have been great all along. And yeah, we it, it's just I know it's probably cool for a lot of devs to see like Borderlands just being used and stuff that they've yeah. they're, they're used to working on. But like yeah, we use all these tools to, to build the game. And the first thing that I'm going to talk about that to me was one of the most exciting innovations that uh, that we built 
uh, is our day-night cycle editor. We have an amazing tools team and rendering team uh, at Gearbox who helped us put all of this stuff together. So like the goal with the day-night cycle and any, any devs who are watching, like if you, if you try to animate a day-night cycle without tools, it's, it's kind of complicated. You have to, there's a couple of different ways to do it. You could do it in sequencer. You can just kind of like hard script it in Blueprint. Or if you remember the Unreal 3 days, we had to do everything in matinee. So we had to keep track of all of the different actors that like contributed to the day-night cycle, like a skylight or a directional light or any meshes and materials. We had to place all these actors in the scene, and we had to make sure that those were consistent across every single map. And that was just a nightmare to work with. Towards the end of the project, we had one guy, uh, Carl, who would go in and he would, he would pretty much spend like so much time just like copy pasting like from map to map, and we had like thirty to forty maps or something like that. Mm -hmm. So, and then if somebody broke something somewhere, uh, you would have to track down that map and, and figure out where it was. And if you made any changes, they wouldn't propagate. So some of the design goals were we wanted a drag and drop solution. So we, we wanted everything to be contained in a single actor. We wanted to have a custom editor that uh, kept track of all the data, and we wanted to be able to save those data sets out and reference them across maps so that, for instance, like all of the day-night cycles in Pandora were the same. So that's kind of the spiel there. So let's kind of like go in and see exactly what this looks like. So we had our tools department give us uh, a specific window, uh, time of day preview controls over here. And this has allowed the developers to kind of come into their scene and just drag the slider uh, up and down to kind of set their time of day so that they can sort of develop the map uh, in whichever you know, time of day that you need it to. And it, and it just works. And this is really cool because our lighting artist would kind of set it to nighttime and they'd come into the map and they would light, uh, you know, the, the majority of the scene uh, for, with man-made lights at nighttime, and then they would test it in the daytime uh, just to make sure that everything looked really good. Because in the daytime, most of the stuff that we're really worried about is just like, what does the sun look like? What does the bounce lighting look like? Because we don't really see too much influence of all these other lights. But when we go to, to nighttime, you know, the auto exposure kicks in, and we start to see all of these light contributions and, and how they affect the scene at nighttime. Uh, and all of these lights, like we're not doing anything crazy like animating like the state of lights, we're not turning them on or off, we're not really scaling the intensity or anything like that because we're making use of high dynamic range. So uh, at nighttime, uh, because we're using like close to physically accurate lighting values, uh, the camera will expose up and you'll actually start to, to see those lights uh, in the scene. Like if you look at the ground here, We've got this purple lighting from this light right here, and it's, it's just a standard light. Like it's, it's right here. It's one of these lights. There's a bunch of them. Uh, but if you think about like if, you, if you've got like a if you got a floodlight in your garage or on your garage that like shines on your driveway, if that's on in the daytime, you don't see that, even though that's a really bright light. Uh, but as soon as it gets to dusk and it goes into nighttime, that light is, if it's still on, it's still, it, it becomes very bright because of the way that our eyes adjust. And we took full advantage of that as we were developing. Yeah, so. Oh, oh boy. That Dropped was the water. first. Yeah. Well, <laughs> I'm a huge klutz, so that that's not okay. going to happen. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> so let's t actually take a look at what our day-night cycle tool uh, actually looks like. Uh, you know what, first, before that, let's actually just click on the sky. And I'll kind of show you guys like what we did here. So when I said it was a drop and, uh, drop and, dra uh, dra drag, and drag and drop <laughs> actor, God, I can't talk, uh, drag and drop actor, uh, we had one of our tools uh, team people just make a blueprint that has a custom like time of day component on there that was kind of like the tracker for all that data. But all of the components here are stuff that's very recognizable. Like a, a, a skylight actor just has a skylight component. Same with a directional light actor or an atmospheric fog component. Uh, and we just pretty much dragged all of those components that we needed into this singular actor. And we have some other stuff that we can tack on there, like cloud rings and skybox stuff. And for instance, like Elpis back here is, is, is part of that subclass of that particular mm -hmm. actor. But these are the main components that the time of day editor actually looks for. 
So now that we've got that out of the way, let's go ahead and open up this asset editor. So if you look at this, it kind of looks like sequence because we, you know, we want it to, to look similar to sequencer with like the timeline and all that stuff, but we mm -hmm. also want it to be custom to what we want it to do. So <clears throat> on the left over here, uh, you know what, I'm just going to make this a little bit smaller so we can actually see the scene. When you have this, when, the, when you have this editor open, you can you could slide this back and forth, and you can still see what's going on in the scene, which is really nice. Uh, but over here on the left, we have layers or uh, that we can transition to at gameplay. So if you've played Borderlands, uh, you know that there's a part in Pandora where you know there's some boss battles that we wanted to happen specifically at nighttime. So instead of just like locking the time of day cycle and like uh, to a specific time, we can just transition to a specific layer. Uh, this is like the uh, this is a part of the game where like the moon gets kind of phase locked. Uh, I don't know about spoilers or anything like that, but that's all I'm going to say about it. But you know, we just kind of like lock it in place and we make sure the keyframes are all shared. Uh, we have different ones for the main menu than we do for uh, you know the game proper. They're just kind of like subtle changes. Uh, and, and some planets will have different layers too, like our Eden 6 time of day layer has all of the different maps in their own layers because we want to get really uh, granular with like what those day-night cycles felt from map to map. But let's look at some of these keyframes. So if we click on a keyframe, over here on the right, these are the keyframe properties that we added. We've got, uh, up first, we've got uh, some general parameters, and these are collection parameters that we can sort of like opt into for each time of day uh, time of day asset. So I like click off here, like we have a parameter collection that's being referenced right here. We have these prop, uh, these arrays called allowed scalar parameters and allowed vector parameters. And this is where we are able to opt in. So if we were to opt in any of these parameters that we've got, like I could add one really quick here. Uh, here's all of our collection parameters and I could add one here, and when I click back on the keyframe, that is now accessible for me uh, to animate. So it's very flexible for any tech artist or any content artist that need to add a specific shader parameter that they need to edit throughout the course of the day-night cycle. The things that we used these scalar and vector parameters are on the most were like things that actually happens out in the sky, like the clouds. So none of that, none of these clouds are being dynamically lit. They're all emissive or fake lit uh, because of runtime performance. Mm -hmm. We didn't want to have a bunch of translucent lit actors in the sky that were overlapping, so we just figured that an emissive lit approach um, or unlit shader was the cheapest way. And it gave the artists the most flexibility too because they can get really creative with the types of colors that they animated the day, uh, day and night transitions with. You can see how pretty it gets like in some of these golden hours here. And our lighting team just did such an amazing job with all of this stuff. And they were able to pretty much get everything that they wanted to with this particular system. And that's <coughs> all just a uh, texture, right? There's no no, no volumetric? Um. No. So we, we do have volumetric fog in the game in some spaces. We didn't ship with it on like Xbox and PS4, but we shipped with it on the Pro and the PC. But we're not relying on actual volumetric fog or any like ray marks stuff mm -hmm. in the sky. Uh, we had some concept artists uh, paint all of our sky dome and cloud textures. Lucas and, and Tris and uh, Adam and Vara painted a lot of these. And they just did, like, I mean, just it's really pretty. And it yeah. did exactly what we wanted it to do. Like, when you're playing a shooter, you're not looking up at the sky too much anyways. <laughs> so, no, we just, we, we made sure that we had like a really nice horizon cloud ring mm -hmm. and just interesting things going on in the sky in general so that everything felt good. So moving on with the keyframes to kind of keep demoing this, uh, once we get past the collection parameters and stuff like that, this is when we get all of the other you know, recognizable properties that you would want to play with uh, from the directional light, the skylight, the atmospheric fog, the exponential fog. All of those parameters are here and keyframable. We even have uh, crap ton of post-process effects too because Carl gets really into like color grading and things like that and they just like they, like I said they wanted the most control that they they could have and we just made sure that we had that 
So if you're probably wondering what these checkboxes are, so one thing that we didn't want to have happen is like weird interpolations happening with like m um, like minute changes or duplicate keyframes. So for instance, uh, <coughs> we have this uh, time of day variable right here, and this is just something that the shader reads. It's a zero to one parameter where like midnight is zero and uh, the midnight on the on the tail end is one, so we have a normalized range for the entire day night cycle. And instead of having to, you know, make sure that the value interpolates smoothly across all these keyframes, we can sort of like opt out of animating that particular value. So if we click on this keyframe here, uh, we could set it to zero, and then we could come over here to this keyframe and like set it to one and then disable that on all of these values in between. So you can see that it's like enabled on some, but not on others. This means that like someone actually didn't do this right. <laughs> but you know, it's a house of cards it's yeah. game development. It, it must not have mattered too much for this particular map. Close enough for jazz. Yeah, so we could just disable that keyframe and it will do a smooth linear interpolation across the entire day night cycle. So we could opt out a keyframe so not all properties are getting in. And these little purple guys underneath, these are states that we actually tie into gameplay. So we could query in Blueprint what time of day uh, it is currently. Mm -hmm. So that Blueprint can do something either on construction script or it can receive callback events. So imagine um, like a torch flame effect or something like that, or even a spawner being activated or deactivated depending on the time of day. So we built all of that into the system, and it, was, it, was, it just worked out so amazingly well. <coughs> and I guess now would be a good time to take any questions. Yeah, uh, if anybody has any questions about this, like I'd be more than happy to. to yeah, for everyone, chat, feel, feel free to ask as many questions as you got. We, uh, well, I'm fortunate to have these guys for quite a while here. At least I'm hoping so. Um, oh yeah, we've got plenty of time. Yeah. Yep. So um, they were a little bit curious. Let's see. There was one related to. Um, they were wondering if it's all dynamic lighting or if it, if there's something that's baked. Okay, so that's actually a really good question. Uh, we we did like a sort of a hybrid approach to our lighting. So in Borderlands, we we have a, a stationary directional light so that we get like nice dynamic shadows, but the light isn't dynamic. We're not moving it throughout the scene at all. Uh, it stays stationary in the sky, and we bake the we bake lighting. Uh, so we can get so we can get like bounce lighting and all that stuff because we just didn't really like the feel of of dynamic like the way that dynamic lit stuff worked in in our particular game. We wanted to get all that bounce lighting and stuff like that. So we we baked everything, uh, but yeah, the, the directional light itself is stationary, and I think the skylight is also stationary, if I recall co correctly. I mean, we could just look. Uh, where's the details? Oh, that one. Uh, that one. Uh, yeah. There we go. Yeah. So the the skylight was stationary. But that's actually a really good question to segue into the next thing we're going to talk about, which is reflections. Yeah. Um, <coughs> we since we were using a high dynamic range, it's it was really challenging for us to make sure that everything looked good at at nighttime because we were baking the lighting. And we needed to have a way for like metals and other glossy surfaces to reflect a good, uh, an accurate reflection environment. And the, the tools that come stock with Unreal, like they're they're quite flexible. But the the thing, the only thing that we really had available to us was uh, we either had to like recapture the sky, the skylight, and com completely rely on the skylight's uh, reflection capture, or we had to uh, tint and adjust uh, just the the reflection environment like post. And that wasn't particularly good for us because we have lots of emissive things going on. We wanted to um, also change the sky a lot. And if you've got like a really colorful sky and you just add a tint to it, it's not really enough to get us where we needed to be. So our rendering engineers upgraded our uh, sphere reflection capture actors to do some really cool stuff. And I can kind of show you what that looks like here. So here is a... This is just a metal sphere with a metallic shader that has roughness set to zero, so we can kind of see a mirror uh, reflection of the environment. And if we change the time of day cycle, 
you can see that yeah. all of that is updating in uh, pretty much not every frame, but we kind of have like a, a, a latent kind of capture going on mm -hmm. where uh, it's kind of like accumulating itself every six frames or something like that. Or I, I can't remember exactly how our rendering team did it, but they made it so that um, I think like one face of the key map would get captured like once a frame just for performance reasons. Like it just made it cheaper. And the time of day cycle changes so slow that you don't perceive any of uh -huh. that stuff. So it was just a clever way to optimize it. Uh, towards the end of shipping. I don't know what that big purple sphere is. I think uh, just move that away. So the, the way that we did this is every one of our reflection probes kind of captured like, it, it, they're like mini buffers in that. So it would, it would capture just the unlit scene. It would capture the emissive scene, and those are RGB maps. And we also had a, um, we had a flag on our primitives that said, like, draw into our real-time sky environment map. And that kind of cr dynamically creates a mask in the cube map. So anywhere where you see sky here is actually just think of it as a mask, where if you imagine anything that's in the scene is white and or maybe black, and the, the, the sky is white, it would composite the real-time sky in uh, to match what they captured in the buffers. So I think I do need to clarify, though. We weren't capturing the scene every frame. We were only capturing what was called our real-time sky environment map, which were the actors specifically flagged to be rendered into that pass. Okay. So that was almost always just stuff in the sky box. It was just the cloud layer, uh, the sky dome, and some of those emissive clouds, things like that. So it was usually only like five or six draws into that particular scene. And then we composited into what we actually capture. We also capture like the directional light, its influence on the scene, and the bounce lighting. So we can edit those later in post. Uh, or not in post, but like in the actual time of day uh -huh. cycle. And that just gives us sort of like this way to mm, efficiently update reflections that kind of feel like they're real time, but it's, it's almost like it's pseudo real time, right? Because the scene is baked, the sky is real time, and we composite those together. And we needed to do that because if we didn't, when we went to nighttime, we would get like really bright reflections because the, the static cubes or the, you know, the key map capture actors were static. So they would be reflecting what they captured in the daytime mm -hmm. at nighttime. And that didn't really work well for us. So we had to kind of play with some, uh, some ways to fix that. And the solution that our entering team came out with was, was really well. It worked amazingly well for us. It even did uh, a really good job in interiors, too. Like, we can zoom all the way over here in the Shiv's room. And this is all baked. And when we change the time of day, you know, the only thing that's really changing here is you can kind of see that fog yeah. getting changed because that was just a property that we were changing. But nothing out here is changing, or nothing in here is changing, which is good because we don't want it to. But, you know, outside of here, you can see, like, on the walls, Yep. all of that is changing because that's all coming from the bounce lighting. So we get really good uh, just scene lighting that we don't really have to worry about it. We just light it like a regular scene, and everything just works with the time of day system. Is that using some kind of global illumination to do that bounce lighting? Uh, just what, uh, whatever baked from the directional light. Okay. Yeah, so it's, it's just light mass. Uh, but we, we capture the contribution of of light mass uh, in those probes as a, as a specific channel. So like the, the main direct light gets captured, and then the bounce light gets captured into a separate channel, like the green channel. And then we can tweak those values when we kind of like recomposite the scene mm -hmm. together. So we get like, it's like kind of like fake lighting. It's almost like each one of these is like a really lightweight deferred renderer just for the reflection pass and like the GI pass or, you know, like the, like the skylight ambience yeah. and stuff like that. So it, it does a really great job at tying all the scenes together. It, it, was, uh, it was really cool. Uh, I guess so we can move on from that, unless anyone else wants to know anything else. Uh, they were curious if the uh, time of day editor was done all in C++. It was. Yeah, we did not do that in, in Blueprint at all. Uh, our tools team just kind of took what was in the engine and kind of just we're like, all right, cool. I, I could I could use all this stuff that's already here to 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 make this look just like the way we want it to look. And then there was some homebrew stuff for like the keyframes and stuff like that. 
but a lot of it was uh, just really clever data management and interpolation, uh, and it perform performed really well and was really easy to use. So yeah, shout beautiful. out to the tools team and the renders team. You guys are awesome. Like we wouldn't be Keep able to do this Give it up and shout for the tools team. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, they were wondering what the total size of this map is. Like in megabytes? Uh, no, I, I believe oh. it in, in terms oh. of units. <laughs> okay. Um, you would probably know that more Oof. than me. Uh, I mean, we could just straight yeah. I think I think giving them uh, yeah, an idea might be uh, go, like go, go to the top down. Oh, you mean like, like actual top oh, down? Okay. Yeah. Let's do a little oh. thing. Where the hell is it? There it is. Top. And then yeah. So that's here's the play space where you see like the terrain pretty much. And then the rest of this okay. is skybox. Sky sky yeah, mm -hmm. ground and skybox. So what is the uh, middle mouse click? Yeah, middle mouse click. Yeah, so let's just say seventy thousand units ish, seventy to eighty. And this is one of our smaller maps. Yeah, this is like actually one of the smallest maps in the game. Yeah, besides the circles of slaughter, improving grounds, this is the smallest real estate in the game. I don't do a lot of measuring in this view, as you probably realize. I was like, <laughs> I was yeah. like, I know you can do it. I just can't remember the key. When when I get to to my part of the demo, we actually have a really clever tool our Quebec studio made uh, that, that kind of uses a bunch of our standard sizing metrics to really help uh, block out spaces quickly. <coughs> that, it was another question. They were curious um, how much you're, you're, if, you're, if you're utilizing streaming levels. Um, we, we actually don't. Uh, uh, we stream with stuff that like, we kind of just get for free, like textures and all that stuff. Mm -hmm. But because we're doing just like kind of isolated maps, we just pretty much load the stuff that we need for those maps, and uh, we just do it. We, we just do it that way. Yeah. Uh, one of the reasons we do that is because we have we do local co-op and uh, local split screen, and we we aren't we're not on dedicated servers. So it's really important for us to make sure that the players feel like they they can kind of go everywhere in a map and be separate from their player uh, the other players if they need mm -hmm. to be, and we don't want to like tether them back. So there's some games that actually do that, and it doesn't really feel that great. So this is the solution we landed on, just kind of like old school map development, where we load everything in, we let everybody do whatever they want to. Because if uh, if we had to implement some streaming method, we probably wouldn't have the same freedoms that we did. Yeah, because we have drop in, drop out multiplayer yeah. online uh -huh. as well. It just <coughs> helps that like we don't have to like understand you know multiple s multiple user states over a network and understand like what streaming bits need to be and what and what combat areas are relevant to which user so and that can also get pretty heavy on a uh, like on the for the host right that he would have to manage all of that on his yeah. uh, CPU yeah um, and so you're taking that out of the equation and, um, but uh, are you still using sort of sub levels for oh yeah uh, managing oh, sort yeah. Of what so it works on yeah, yeah I'll pop open the uh, the sub levels here so we have a lot right we've got we've got sub levels d dedicated specifically to missions mm-hmm and we've got you know we've got audio effects, combats. I mean, just read the list. Uh, this this made it so that uh, all of our departments can kind of like work on the same map at the same time because they would just check out the effects map and the effects team could go in there and they can populate it and then check that in. And uh, it just it just made it really really easy for multiple people to work on the same map at once. Yeah, even some of our. Uh, level art maps like down there where you see recruitment and terrain and, and light and intro those are different zones of the area and then like the lighting sub level yeah, and so that way one level artist can be you know kind of propping <coughs> out the be the beginning area another can be propping out the boss fight area another one could be doing lighting and we can mm -hmm. just parallelize that work as much as possible yeah, so like I just unhid the skybox level so we would have someone go in and just and lay out the skybox and at the same time a designer would be in here like doing mission combat or something like that mm -hmm. and we had light too so you know if I, I'm, I'm not going to disable lighting because it's gonna like kill perf because all the lighting you know it's just not gonna I'm not gonna risk it, it might crash or something you know it's a lot of demos right yeah we, we did talk a little bit about how to manage a uh, project when it comes to source control and several developers just a couple streams ago we did some uh, version control fundamentals mm -hmm. um, and sub levels is definitely makes that a lot easier since you otherwise you'd have like five t ten level designers all wanting to work out of the same same yeah. file yeah it also allows us to um, we do a lot of uh, automated auditing and automated build testing so when a build runs we can we can understand certain actor types should be in certain levels okay um, so it, it's a lot easier if we sort of split it up and we understand like hey if there's a non-lighting actor inside of the lighting sub level like 
is probably something somebody needs to go track down just because like a static mesh probably got dropped into it accidentally or whatever. So it's not perfect, but it at least helps sort of let everybody know the lane that they should be working in under mm -hmm. best circumstances. They were wondering if, uh, so shadows don't change direction with time of day? Shadows do not change direction of time of day. So th <laughs> this, this is always... Uh, By like, lore. Yeah, oh god. Uh, uh, Oh god, uh, this this has always been like a, a hilarious thing to talk about in the office because there's like purists who are like, and, and sci-fi fanatics who are like they want everything to like work physically accurately, mm -hmm. you know. And and I always get in arguments with some yeah. of my buddies. They're like nobody notices if the yeah. shadows change or not. Uh, the sun, because I you know when I first got on, I was like if the if the sun moves, the shadows need to move. And I'm like, well, no one cares. And they're like, pick a game that has a day-night cycle and try to like remember if the sun disc actually moves. It, there's yeah. some of them that you can pick, mm -hmm. but there's there's some of them that you, yeah. you can't really think of. And like the fact that someone asked in chat, they're like, do the shadows move? Tells you that like no one really pays attention to that. Yeah. They, they see the, the, the lighting change and all that stuff, but... Uh, we're a, we're a game where you throw guns and tiny little dinosaur legs spring out of them and they run around, so yeah. uh, <laughs> realism is not our, our first card to play. Yeah. Uh, by lore, the sun is on the other side of the planet, and it bounces off the moon, and it's in some sort of gravitational lock. Um, yeah, Alpus is supposed to technically be the sun, yeah. uh, and it's it's been that way since Borderlands 1, so we, we, we never changed it. Like, yeah. It's like, well, let's just keep it that way. And this is on Pandora, right? Yeah, yeah, this is on Pandora. So, like, Alpus is actually one of the, the things that we're changing the colors of in the time of day cycle. Like. Uh, yeah, interesting enough, that, that emissive layer on Elpis right there, if I zoom in, like that's always on. But like I said, because of the way that we, we change exposure in the daytime, you never see it because the, the lighting values get all, uh, they change differently. So if I zoom in, you can kind of see it, but Did you just don't notice it. They were curious if the uh, emissive, uh, if the emissive is baked uh, from, from I guess actors in the, in the scene and models that have emissive. Oh, are we using like em, uh, emissive lighting like on the primitives and stuff? Mm -hmm. Sometimes we do. Uh, for things like if we have like a real like a lot like lava or something like that, and we need like a lot of bottom lighting from that, we'll throw in a plane and throw an emissive material on it and turn on emissive okay. lighting and like let that bake into the scene. That always looks a lot better than like hand placing like yeah, 30 lights. Point lights. Again, because we, we are baked, it allows the lighting artists to go in and, and do what we call light painting, where they'll, they can accentuate an area or light the way just with lights and like add color to the scene that way. We don't have to worry about the performance impact of that because it just all gets baked. Yeah, like if you go back to that oil sign, like there's, you know, multiple clusters of lights. There's, there's lights directly up next to it and then yeah. there's like another cluster that's closer to the ground just to sort of emphasize where we want that to be hitting. It gives the artist a lot of freedom, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Did I talk about like the, the how it shines on the ground too? Yeah, I think I mentioned that. Yeah. So this is a, just yeah, another example of how at nighttime we just see the pop of all of this stuff. It's just, God, they did such a good job at it. It's uh, It was one of the first games that we, we made where nighttime, beyond just being like a blue color and some color tinting felt like a completely different level because of the HDR tools. Like when these guys lit it at night and then they, they, they trans transition it, it feels like you're playing in a different map. I mean, it's the yeah. same map, but it looks totally different. Yeah. And that really adds to the longevity of the game because our fans, like they play these games for years. And if it was just static and we didn't have a day night cycle, it would just probably get kind of boring and tedious. Yeah. So this. It is, it is one of the biggest, like, interest <coughs> grids. If you go look at BL1 and BL2 night times, like, there's just sort of a blue wash because yeah. that's just basically what the, the engine could handle. Yeah, before, before PBR lighting, yeah, yeah. it was just, like, everything was flood fill ambient. Uh, so we just, we just had to tweak a couple of pro properties. And with PBR, everything gets a little bit more complicated. It looks a thousand times better, but, yeah, we needed to evolve the tools so that our studio could, like, actually handle that workload of all the complexity that comes with that. But it's a good virtuous cycle because the engine having those tools allowed us to build the day time and day editor, which allowed us to have better tooling to allow the lighting artist to then actually go <coughs> like create the more hand detailed stuff mm -hmm. without it being super time consuming for them. Um, so it's just sort of a now that we have that tool, it's like okay, well, what what can we really take this out for a spin with? Because now we're like good at it and fast mm -hmm. at it. We did some really clever stuff too in in Promethea. We, so we actually, we like invent lore for all the planets that kind of like have stationary shadows. 
it's like just a fun kind of goofy thing that it we works, do. It works, right? Yeah, it works, and it's it's kind of clever, and it, 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 it it's more creative in some respects. Yeah. So like in, in Promethea. Promethea actually has a sun, right? And it's there and it doesn't move and we don't really draw attention to it. But if you look up in the sky, there's an asteroid belt. There's like a huge thick asteroid belt of, on Promethea. And you can see it like orbiting the planet. And it it's like kind of equatorial. So if you look up, you can see asteroids like clip the sun or like occlude the sun. And when that happens, we tied our time of day cycle up to that animation okay. so that when there is an eclipse, we go to full night. Uh -huh. So there's actually like there's like six or eight like nighttime cycles in the Promethea day night cycle that just kind of like happen. And some are longer than others because you look up and you actually see those including the sun. Yeah. And a lot of people might not have ever noticed that detail, but it was something that we paid a great amount of attention to. Yeah. And it's that planet is then also yeah. meant to be like hyper urbanized, mostly yeah. built out environment. It has way less terrain areas and stuff like that in it. So because of that, it has way more of these, you know, neon lights and other ambient light sources that are coming that are not direct sunlight. Mm -hmm. um, and all of that just nicely blends together and you sort of always get this, it almost always feels near dusk uh, kind of vibe, like oh. kind of a little like Tokyo future noir vibe. I can actually kind of show you guys, because of this, this system is so simple, I can go in here and just type in Promethea. Oh, if you could spell. I spelled it wrong. Promethea. I could click on that, and I could come in here, and you see how complicated this day-night cycle is? So we want to do like a Blade Runner approach, but this is, again, this is this is how cool the system is. We could see what another planet's lighting looks like on Pandora, and yeah. it still works just fine. Like, nothing's going to break or anything like that. We could see what we did with the fog and all that stuff. And if we scrub through, you could kind of see like how, like, you know, it's more pink lighting for the horizon, because we had horizon and zenith controls. We had all these things. And these are pretty much keyed specifically to the panning texture that is controlled with that zero to uh -huh. one value that I was telling you about earlier. And then it just loops. So we made it, we made it work uh, to loop with the time of day cycle. And then like Promethea is always changing color and things like that, depending on how occluded the sun is. It's and that seems like something cool. that sort of you stumble upon because of the tools. Exactly. Right? Yeah. Yeah. yeah the, the tools enabled us to do so much more than like we thought we were actually going to do. Because we, we were sitting there whiteboarding it out. And we're like, oh, it would be really cool if we could transition layers and we can do all that and just copy paste keyframes from like one map to the next or even save data of keyframes out. We never got that involved with, with it. We ended up just like sticking to the actual asset itself. But yeah, because of how simple the tools were, we were just able to, to quickly test ideas too. And I remember being in meetings with like Randy and he's like, well, what if we did this? And I'd be sitting there and without this tool, I'd be like, absolutely not. We can't do that. Yeah. But because of it, I was like, mm, yes, we can do that. Yeah. And then a week later, we'd have a prototype of it. And yeah. what if the bad guys phase locked the moon? It's like, yeah. Ugh. What would that? And then like, well, how would that? You know what? Actually, fishing? yeah, we yeah. can do that. <laughs> so I'll just pop Pandora back in here. So uh, yeah, and we can, you know, we set like the starting time of day, and we can transition layers and stuff like that. Uh, yeah, it all, it all just worked. It was great. So if no one else has any questions related to this. We can move on to some other. Yeah, we can keep going. Uh, there, there stuff. are definitely a lot of questions, but we'll try Just to go through. Some you could go ahead and ask them as they come out too. Yeah. Some I of them I might not be able to answer because of stuff that we're not supposed to talk mm -hmm. about. Yeah. Yeah. They were curious how many reflection probes. So we had to limit those because of the upgrade of the reflection probes. They became uh, a little bit more expensive than a standard reflection probe. So we had to take that account into our budget. So, uh, I mean, if Strebel were here, you'd have the actual number. Yeah. But um, I want to say it's, first of all, it depends on how many are on screen at once and how many yeah. overlap. OK, how, right? how, big, how big they are volumetrically and how, yeah. how much they actually overlap yeah. with each other. Yeah, so there, there was just a GPU uh, budget that we had for that. And it was usually like, we didn't want any people to have like more than like three or four of these overlapping for it would be like a really expensive case. So we would usually do something where we, you know, we would have the skylight uh, be the main fallback, and then we would put a, a big one in a room, like a box, and then we would uh, add other ones that informed the, uh, like if something was like really metallic and needed it, we would add one there. But uh, all of those probes, because instead of just one capture, it was three captures, like three different textures or like mini buffers, like I was saying, uh, it kind of reduced the amounts of total probes that we could fit in memory budgeted uh, by 
it, in, it, it decreased that budget by a third because now one probe is kind of like the cost of three in memory mm -hmm. uh, ish you know there's there's probably some other you know th these numbers aren't like super accurate but they're kind of ballparky yeah and every map is like has its own eccentricity yeah. so like you can get away with some more expensive <coughs> stuff in a smaller map if you're not doing really mm -hmm. GPU intensive stuff in there it, it did make it more expensive on the GPU because of all of the the work that needed to go into compiling or not compiling but compositing that reflection environment as yeah. well so we thought that the cost was, was worth it because of the result that we got and, and what we needed to, to light with. So um, we shipped with it. Yeah. Uh, it's also one of those things where it's like you, you know it's working when you don't see a lot of bugs or a lot of customer feedback about it. Like all, all those scopes always look so good with reflections coming off of them. Mm -hmm. You know, all the metallic surfaces feel good. And it doesn't, if you look back at some of the old engine stuff, you can notice some like, eh, that's not, like it's, it's a little over bright at night or a mm -hmm. little like dim during like, noon yeah there's there's some more uh, general questions about the game that I think we can we can dig into um, in the end once we're done with the presentation yeah sure okay. great yeah let's go ahead and move on then uh, so now I'm going to talk about a couple of tools that we built just with with stock blueprint uh, things that were were incredibly useful to the team uh, during development and during uh, just population of, of the world and, and this this is going to be geared more towards um, uh, level artists or you know people who just like like the like the art like the tech art part of all of this like the art part of the tech art and it's all it is is just how we kind of use what already is in Unreal and just kind of enhanced it for our particular workflows so uh, uh, one of our tech artists Brian McNett did some really awesome work with decals uh, we had uh, we subclassed the decal actor, and we made decals that had, uh, you know, like height maps and other things in the shader. And we exposed all of those properties into the decal actor itself to give the most flexibility for the decal. Uh, you know, typically what you might do as an artist is just like kind of make a decal, like think of graffiti or something mm -hmm. like that, and then we bring in the textures and then we'd slap a material on it, and that would be it. And the decal actor would just be a, it would be a decal actor, it would have fading and stuff like that. But what we wanted to do to get the most mileage out of all these decals uh, is expose those materials uh, and all of their properties. Oops. So if I drag this decal off over here, actually, I don't want that one. I want this road one. This one's really cool, this one. So if we go into the details here, we have all of the controls for that particular material, like opacity. Uh, we've okay. got height map blending opacity. So this is like a really great way to change how it actually fades in. And the goal with these, by the way, is to make these as, as absolutely artist friendly as possible. We didn't want our level artists to have to go into Blueprint, go into the material, make material instances. Because of the, the rate that we actually deco these maps out, we needed it to be fast. And that's exactly what these were, were, were meant to do. They were meant to be flexible. So they, you know, they have a lot of parameters that might not always get used, but it, it just ended up being really useful because uh, of how flexible they were. So is that one, on a, oh, go ahead. Yeah, that one, one of, the, by the way, these are debuffer decals as well. So if, if anyone's wondering about that. So we, yeah, we could control like normal strength, things like that. We could change, uh, you know, the color of all of these. Uh, and pretty much all the decal subclasses had all of these properties. So as long as in the material, uh, one of our, one of our tech artists exposed all these and set it up mm -hmm. right, these were just, they became so useful. And these uh, parameters that you're changing here, they're actually not changing the material instance parameters. They're changing it individually for this decal? Uh, so in this particular case, uh, each decal actor creates a dynamic material instance that it gets applied to that decal okay. actor. So every one of these decals has its own material instance, mm -hmm. which has some memory implications, but it's not as much as you might think. It's, we're talking about like kilobytes of um, I mean, even less than that for one of these material instances, because there's not that many properties being edited. But I will say, in f we're on 420. That's what we shipped with. Uh, afterwards, 422, I think it was 422 or 423, introduced the concept of like uh, they're kind of like buffer parameters, or like it's like each primitive component has a constant buffer that you can add and set up in the material itself. So instead of creating dynamic material instances, we can expose. Uh, 
parameters that are specific to that primitive in the scene that get interfaced in the material. I'm probably losing people here. <laughs> uh, but at the end of the day, not all of, like eventually not all of these will create their own material instances. They will use one material, and the material will adapt based off of the properties on the primitive component itself, not based on the materials. And okay, that's, that's yeah. a more technical thing that you guys have released that when it came out, I was like, oh, I wish we had that because we could have we could have optimized our memory just a little bit more, yeah. you know, just a tad bit more. But I mean, from from the big memory, in, <clears throat> like when we're talking about you know some of the you know if we were if we didn't have this level of control, that is a completely different texture sheet that we're having yeah. to bring in to get a decal that behaves like that versus a decal that behaves like this. Um, so the, yeah, we're going to eat a little bit of dynamic material instance cost, but scalar wise against you know a high res texture like it's trivial and also sp the budget between like the crea creation time like the amount of time it takes for someone to actually use the tools versus yeah. how much is saving performance there's you know you have to balance that as well yeah and i mean again it's, it's all about when when we talk about building tools like our our end user is our fellow developers like mm -hmm. it's, it's people at the studio and we want everybody to be maximally creative and fast um, so anything that we can do to speed them up uh, is is really worth it and it maintains like uh, these, this is a this one in particular is a tiling material too, so it maintains its textile density as we scale this up and down, so we don't have to like worry about like rescaling if we needed to take up more space. All right, so that's decals. Let's move over to some actual blueprint tools. So <coughs> one of the things that kind of drove our level artist crazy. Uh, and uh, there's examples of it all over this map, are things like this. Like These are actually cable components, but we don't sim those in the game because they're expensive at runtime to simulate this. There's actually a funny story here. Shrubble got, or Shrubble's our, he's like our optimization guy. We throw his name on all over the, time, all, all over the place because like when someone does something like really bad for perf, he, he's like the boogeyman. He like comes in your office and he's like, "What did you break?" You know, it's uh -huh. it's. <laughs> but he, he's like a very valuable member of the team though, because like he's like one of the few people. Well, not few people, but he's like the main guy who really, really cares about optimization and performance. So we had these cable components, and like <laughs> he would come in one day and he's like, "Why are there 120 cable components in a map?" And then the level artists are like, uh, "It's I'm, pretty." Yeah, uh, yeah, because I just wanted to use them, and you know, that's they're they're fast fast to work with. So uh, we either had to, we had a ditch doing that, we couldn't sim them, uh, but we, we, we changed them so that we didn't simulate, but like they, they kind of did, and then when they, they got to the area that they needed to get, we can like lock them and then copy those around. But that took forever, and it was a bad workflow, and people didn't like it, and the designers wanted to have like a start point and an end point, and they wanted to drag those up and see it like update instantly. And this map doesn't have a lot of them because this map was completed before we made the tool uh, uh, well on into the de into development, so these kind of things like really drove artists artists crazy when they were placing them. Same like this is actually the perfect example because these flags are static meshes, and they're not very flexible because if if someone wants to come in here and like move this post, like I don't know, we'll just move it this way. That's broken. Yeah. And then well. I'm going to have to scale this up, and then I'm going to have to do all this, and like it doesn't matter where the pivot point is. This is just a huge pain in the butt. So we kind of made a, a new type of actor uh, called, it was like a, a hanging spline actor, essentially. And I'm just going to go ahead and drag that guy out here and pull it up. And you'll notice this, this start point and end point. These labels are kind of like not on the widgets because I think we're doing some screen scaling right here, but ignore that for now. So what these guys did, uh, we used what's called a, a catenary formula to kind of calculate the physical hang of cables when you have a start point and end point. You can kind of just calculate that iteratively. And we use Blueprint to do that all in the construction script. So with a few properties and some start and end points, we can move these around, and you can kind of see how that updates. And we had some really cool variables to work with, like uh, tension. Like we can make them tight, we can make them really loose. And this isn't just like a, parabo a parabolic arc. Para parabola, whatever. You got it. Yeah, OK, I'm, I'm close to being there. Um, so like when you, when you drag it up like that, you get that nice like sag yeah. right here. And 
yeah, there's there's easier ways to do this, but they don't. Sometimes they get hit uncanny valley because you can't get that exact physical look without doing this all mathematically, or simulating it like the cable components mm -hmm. do, right? So yeah, you can calculate all that stuff, um, and uh, we use the procedural procedural mesh component to then create a we like I call it lofting the spline, right? We we create the verts that go along the, the resulting spline. And we just make a tube that kind of like fits over that spline. And then we just get rid of the spline component in the construction strip. So when you're looking at the actor, the only thing you really see over here is um, the uh, default scenery. But you actually should see the procedural mesh component. I'm not, why, I'm not entirely sure why that's not showing up, but it doesn't really matter. But you know, we can do things like change the amount of edge loop. So if the resolution ever gets a little cruddy here, we can just like set that to like 50 or something like that. It smooths it out. You could change how many sides are on there uh, and the radius and all that stuff. So that's really cool. And they they absolutely love these because duplicating these and changing the tension was it was just a really great way to hang wires, uh, attach them to other blueprints, things like that. And it just made their workflow way easier. And that's that's all just done in stock blueprint. Like that's the power of blueprint. We can do like these really cool things like that. But uh, one day, one of the uh, level artists is like, well, what if I wanted to like hang something from these, like those flags that you saw earlier? And I was like, yeah, absolutely, we can do that, because we know where the spline is. Uh, and we can scatter anything we want on there with uh, hierarchical instant static mesh actors and, and essentially get all kinds of stuff scattered on these things for really cheap. We're talking like a draw call per uh, unique mesh that's being added to these components. So we have. Uh, we have the ability to do that here with these uh, hanging mesh like data assets that we made. So these are just structs. Uh, we have a struct, and then we could select the mesh. We could override the material, and we can change all these parameters, like how many things get scattered on those. And I'm going to show you a quick example of where these got used the most, and that was in the Eden Six system. And we just subclass those. So you know, we 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 made the structs. We set the default parameters, and then we subclass that into a new blueprint, and we called it hanging vine. And when we drag hanging vine out, we get something that looks like this. So you may notice here that we have a mesh that is also kind of going along that spline catenary. Well, that's because we used uh, spline mesh components. So we can measure how long these things were on their x-axis, and then we can kind of like divide those up along the spline and just add those dynamically in the construction script as well. So that when an artist wants to create like kind of like that Eden 6 bayou feel, they can just do that. And they can move these. And it's all very fast. And yeah. all of these are getting populated in the construction scripts. Yeah, and the moss is all hanging down, so you're not getting any of the weird like rotation at the edge bits. Mm -hmm. And we could change things like we could jitter these and just set all these properties. We could change how many we want. So if we like went crazy and added like a hundred, we could do that. And we even added a scale curve that looked at the the total like normalized distance of the spline, and we could change the scaling of those mesh depend depending on where it actually is on that spline. So you could kind of see like this is the scale curve. And that's where this peaks right here is right in the middle. So if I wanted to do something crazy just to show that off, I can kind of do that. And it doesn't update until I actually move it. Let's see how it, it changed that scale mm -hmm. over there. I think you go up even higher. By the way, we love seeing everything that's crazy. OK, yeah, let's break it. Let's look really high. Boom. So it, like, it actually doesn't really break. It just it adds another cool profile. So that they all don't look the same, uh -huh. and this is this is done with our um, uh, with the curve tables. Like yeah, super default. useful. Anytime you have a value that you can look up, especially a spline or UV coordinates or whatever, uh, any kind of variable that you put on a mesh, that uh, you need to map it to another value, these curve assets are just amazing. They're amazing. We use we use them all over the place too. Don't we use them in design quite a lot too? Yeah, curve math. If if you if you really want to get into really good technical design and technical art, like learn curve math. Um, there's a great GDC talk. Uh, Squirrel runs the the GDC math track or math for game devs track. There's almost every couple of years there's some sort of talk. So if you get in the GDC archive, like there's always lots of really good talks about it. Because like 
once you start thinking that way, you just optimize your workflows so efficiently because uh, you're not having to constantly hand key values. So it's just really fun to play with too. Uh, once you get in here uh, and you know playing with attention variables to get these different binds, you can just really lay down some cool, cool silhouette uh, detail. And you know I'm not a level artist, so like this stuff probably isn't going to look as good as like you know like Dave or Brad can do, but. I'm just like dropping names left and right. These don't mean anything to anybody. Like, <laughs> uh, but they mean something to me. All right. Yeah. So we did that for a lot of decoration as well. Yeah. Uh, ooh, I see a Houdini question up there. Yeah, there is a, they, they were curious if you were thinking about using Houdini um, to do s similar things. We, we did use the Houdini engine for some things. Uh, the problem, first of all, I love Houdini. Houdini is great. We're using it a crap ton right now. Uh, we didn't. We, we were ramping up on Houdini during production of Borderlands. It was still kind of a fresh tool, and it's a very scary tool to learn. Uh, and all of our tech artists, and some even some of our level artists, are starting to learn it now. So we didn't get to use it as much as I think we we probably could have for Borderlands, but we are definitely going to be using it in the future. One thing that uh, the Houdini engine like. Uh, it's kind of slow when it generates because it's not using procedural mesh components right now. It's it's running the script and it's outputting a static mesh. So when you're changing values and stuff, you do not get the same speed and feedback that you would get from changing values in Blueprint. Yeah. Blueprint works super fast. It's like that. And I know I've talked to uh, Louise at, at Side Effects, and he said that the well, you know what? I'm not gonna. I, I can't remember if this. I'm not supposed to talk about that. So I'm just gonna not say anything else. Leave that for later in case. Yeah, but let's just say that there's there. Uh, I think Houdini will probably end up being a little bit quicker in the future. Like I think, predicting. God, don't sue me. <laughs> <laughs> How uh, dare you say nice uh, things about them? Uh, yeah, but they're, they're no, gonna he, be here on the stream. Uh, th those in a few months. So those <laughs> those guys. I just want to like shout out to the Houdini guys. Those guys are so good. They're so awesome with their their community outreach. And they listen to the developers, and they make sure that like anything that we suggest or anytime we need help with their tools, they are there instantly to yeah. to help us. And I have so much love for that whole company and what they're doing because it's just it's making our jobs as tech artists like so much easier with all their procedural tools. Yeah, they they care about pipeline, and like I was saying, like we we want our people to just be able to like get in the editor and jam <coughs> as quickly as possible mm -hmm. and like achieve the things that they want to do. And like every time you talk to people from the Houdini team, like they're mentally at that space already. Yeah, like they they come to our studio every year just to like be like, what are you guys working on? What do you need? Like, can we do anything? And it's always great. You go get pizza. It's fun. All right, so. The next natural evolution yeah. of this, when people started using it and seeing it, was the lighting team. They were like, well, we do this thing where we hang like lights from these wires all the time, and that's a huge pain in the ass because I have to go individually and place these static meshes, and I have to go place lights, and I have to make sure I like make sure the colors all match, and if I set the wrong value and I'm editing the day-night cycle and the value's not bright enough, I have to go through all of these and like shift-click them all, and it's a huge pain. So. We extended the hanging spine tools to lights. And you could see these all over the place in this particular map. So this is one of those tools that when we, when we extended it, they went back and ripped out all the temp stuff that was there. And because lighting kind of comes at the end of the, end of the mm -hmm. cycle, uh, the, the development cycle, because maps seem to be locked down, they were able to use a lot of these tools when we actually made them. Because we made like, God, the, the development goes, it's so fast that like we have stuff that we're like, yeah, we'll get to it, we'll get to it, we'll get to it. And then we're like, hey, the game needs to ship in six months. And we're like, oh, crap, we really need to make those tools now. So we did that. And, and here's, a, here's an example of uh, them using uh, those here. So this is a special subclass of these. And these do everything that you just saw, except they also add lights. And we have these here, a special category that we just added to a subclass that allows us to go in and kind of change the light color. Let's like set them to blue. So we're going in there and we're making sure that the material instance is getting updated and all that stuff. Uh, and let's go to nighttime because we can do that really easily. See that a little bit better. Yeah. So let's change the color of these lights. Oh, it's baked, so it's not yeah, going to change. They're not going to do it. Uh, if I move it, they will, though. The material instance will. Well, the material instance will, but this one. So let's just 
break the lighting really quick. There we go. It's kind of changing. Let's do something else, like change the intensity. Boom. 5,000. There we go. Yeah, there we go. Yeah, so now you can really see that. And we can make it even brighter by adding more lights. And those, I think, are controlled via this. So we got like 10 more lights. Hey. And change the tension. And what these, uh, these are static lights uh, when they come out. So uh, until lighting is actually baked, uh, these are super expensive because they're all dynamic until right. they get baked. So at first, you know, the, the lighting guys were placing these, and then I would get a visit from Strobel and be like, what is going on? What did you do? And I'm like, relax. <laughs> they need to bake the lighting. And they would bake the lighting, and it would be fine. So, so we, made, we made a lot of different types of, of light actors for the team as well. Some change color. Some, some uh, can randomly select between different colors of lights and all that stuff, and it's all very easy for them to manage. Yeah, and when you go to Athenas, they've got, you know, more... Uh, Asian-inspired lighting mm -hmm. lanterns. Um, Asian we lanterns use um, like empty beer bottles um, with like light bulbs inside of them as lighting inside Sanctuary and a couple other different places. Um, it was funny because like I I end up having to make a lot of the our main menu has alternate backgrounds that turn on for holiday mm -hmm. events. We we needed to do a background for Christmas event, but we didn't have any like Christmas art. But we had these things sitting off the shelf, so it just populated with red and green beer bottle light strands everywhere. Like five, minu go. five minutes later, I have a Christmas theme background. Didn't have to bug lighting team. Didn't have to bug art team. Like the the content just allowed people to riff on it quickly. Mm -hmm. And I want to hang these all the way across the map because I am a lighting artist for this stream. <laughs> That's beautiful. Isn't it nice? More. <laughs> <laughs> All right, ship it. Yep. It's good to go. Let's make this higher. All right, so, and I think the last thing I'm going to talk about, another blueprint tool, and I'm, I just like to, I'm sticking off uh, to, to spline tech, or like things that we did with the spline component, because I just think that the spline component is like the best thing that's that's ever happened. <laughs> In my life, well, not in my life, but um, in game development. There you go. Unreal. Way to walk that yeah, back. Yeah, I'm gonna walk that. <laughs> my wife's probably like, she's oh, watching okay. right now. Yeah, she's like, all right, so I guess I'm not as cool as Splines. Like, <laughs> oh, she's she's awesome. Uh, the struggles of game <laughs> development relationships. Um, yeah, so let's look at. Uh, so we we wanted to extend these to tarps because we've got all of these bad boys, or these guys, like these dudes. We've got these guys all over the game, and these are really frustrating to work with too because of the same exact problems as like the the flags. Yeah. Uh, you know, an artist would have to make a shape, and they would have to conform their entire space to the shapes of tarps that they had. But they also wanted the tarps to hang realistically. So, one of our uh, uh, one of our level artists came to me one day, and he was like can we do the same thing that we do with the hanging splines for cloth? And I was like, no, I don't think we can. And then I, I, I sat there and I was like, well, wait. And I was like, all right, well, what is a cloth like when you hang it from four points? It's not just like, you know, four catenaries or cross sections of catenaries. So uh, I tested it out and it turns out that it actually works. It's not like physically accurate, but it's enough to kind of give these guys exactly what they need. I'm gonna I'm gonna close out the world outliner. Yeah. I'm, I'm not gonna close out of that because it will snap it back. So let's just drag this down. All right, whatever. So when I made this, I was in this point of my like this mindset of like just keep it as simple as absolutely possible. So I didn't want to expose any like crazy material things or anything like that. Or I just wanted to expose like color because I was looking at what they were doing with cloth and I was like, all right, they seem to just be choosing a couple of different materials and changing the color and like the wind direction and speed and stuff like that. So I did this thing where I enumerated styles, right? The, the types of style, cloth styles. So I have block out and I had different types of, I pretty much just looked for all the cloth and, and tarp materials that we had. And I made it so that we can just hot swap those without us having to like kind of go through 
uh, the material editor and looking for these. And it looks like some of these aren't working, but they should. They might be compiling materials or something like that in the back end. Uh, that's actually probably it. I wonder if I just leave it here for, we'll give it five seconds to. Live game development off yeah, our network. Yeah, yeah. All right, cool. <laughs> We're just going to go back to TARP because it looks pretty, whatever. So when we move these guys around, we can set how we want this tarp to hang. And you'll notice it has the same kind of, uh, I gotta change this camera speed. It has the same kind of variables that the other catenary side, like we can adjust tension of specific sides. So this gave like really great shape controls yeah. to the artist as well. You made so many level artists happy with this. I probably made a lot of content artists happy too because they stopped getting yeah. tarp requests. Well, it's also just, I mean, like talking about bugs, like those tarps that are up in the ceiling or up in the skybox, like, you know, we had to keep baking those multiple times because, you know, little minor things in the geo would change just over time. Like the tower gets a little taller or a crate that it was attached to got moved for gameplay reasons. And now some, some environment artist needs to go in and, and take that thing and make minor adjustments to it over and over and over again. We can do fun things here, like these are all the material settings I set up for these guys. There's not many, but change the color, and oh, you want it to be really windy? Cool, let's like set that to five or like 10 or something like that. And now it just gets like a nice panning wind value. And we have like, we have wind actors in the map that, that just change the direction, so it'll automatically pick up from the wind strength that that thing is, is doing, so everything just ties in nicely, and everything's blowing in the same direction and all that stuff. Is that the default wind actor, or did you write a custom one? We had a custom one that, and it wasn't anything like special. It All the custom one was doing was piping its like direction and strength to mm -hmm. a collection parameter. Uh, it, it might have been doing a little bit more, but I don't think we did anything C++ with it. We just made it do what we needed it to do to interface with all of our art and our foliage and stuff, uh, and we just used that. We just called it the uh, you know Borderlands wind actor. You know, we put it in the maps. And it just worked. So, um, I mean, I'd love to open up this blueprint, but I just don't think I have the time to kind of go through everything. Yeah, I'm not. I'm not even gonna bother. It's I, here. You get to see what the construction script looks like. <laughs> that's it, guys. Just find the construct cloth node, and that's gonna <laughs> work for everything you need to do. <laughs> No, here's a construction script. It's not It's not that bad. It's like what you don't see up here, there's actually two splines. It's just two splines, and that's 0 0.0, 0 0.1, 0 0.2, and 0 0.3. Those are the ends of the splines. And we adjust those, and it's like two wire components, and then I do cross-section catenaries. And I just translate all those points to a procedural mesh component, which um, comes out looking like, like that. So it's... Very simple, we can change the amount of segments. You just have those kind of flexible flexible controls, and I think you could also change like UVs and stuff like that. So, uh, and yeah, here's all of those tarp variants that somehow work in thumbnail, but not in the in the viewport, so. Do you bake those out as a static mesh once it's been generated, or do they stay nope. as procedural? Well, they stay as procedural, because okay. there's, there's not, like we're talking about like the mesh memory for that is not it's, there's not going to be like a thousand of these in the map. Mm -hmm. There are, we're going to come talk to you at your desk. But there's not, like our artists know better to not to do that. So we just eat the cost. If, if there's a flag on memory, yeah, we'll go in and we might bake those down. But there's no point if it's not impacting memory in, in, a, in a really bad way. Maybe this works now. Uh, no, okay. Well, I'm just probably going to end my portion of the demo with that. Cool. I think. Covered a lot of stuff. Yeah. Uh, uh, we could answer questions before we pass it off to you. Any? Do you want to? Do you want to answer questions and I'll load up my stuff? Sure. Yeah, yeah that's cool. good. Let's go through. We have a lot of questions. Um, they were curious if you ever used any Unreal Engine Marketplace content for prototyping. Uh, if we did, we didn't ship with it. Uh, that doesn't mean that we couldn't have. Uh, I just don't think that we were, yeah, I just, I just really don't think that we did. Uh, a lot of that content that comes in isn't, doesn't like match, especially if it's art content, mm -hmm. it doesn't match the style of the game. So we would right. have to redo it anyways. But there is actually really cool, um, 
like blueprints like there's like really cool ivy generators and other there's i mean everyone has their own home brew of like cane cloth or yeah. Uh, there's a really cool one that like drapes wires and like does collision detection and like will even like wrap it. Like we would look at the marketplace and then someone would come to me and be like, "Hey, we need that." And I'd be like, "Do we?" Uh, and if the answer was yes, I'd be like, "All right, I'll just I'll just make our own version that does everything that we need to, so we don't have to <laughs> spend fifteen dollars." Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, there's you think, also if you, you think about it that way. Yeah. Else's, uh, yeah. Assets. And if you can make them, it's a little bit easier. Yeah. For me, the fun is. My job is the most fun when, like, I'm challenged to kind of like recreate something that someone's done. Um, using marketplace content, well, it's it's absolutely cost effective mm -hmm. if if it's right for your game. We just we just didn't do it, and I like I like making my own versions of things. I like to try and be like, can I recreate that? And that's a lot of what drives what I like to do. Yeah. What else do you pr you probably have a large library of assets from the other two games that in case you need something. Yeah, uh, believe it or not, though, uh, the because last gen wasn't PBR and our style is is kind of toony and like very stylistic. A lot of that content didn't have some of the maps that were required for PBR. Okay. So they didn't have roughness maps. They didn't have metallic maps. Uh, so a lot of them didn't have normal maps because we baked all the lighting, and when you bake lighting, uh, you don't see too much of that detail, especially when you don't have a yeah. strong reflection. Especially the BO1 assets in particular, mm -hmm. like they're just. There's such deep blacks inking on it that like you would never see a normal map in a million years. What we did though is we would take some of those and retexture them. So we would take the content and we would have someone go in and either uh, sometimes the source had normal maps and they would bring it into Painter or Photoshop mm -hmm. and they would generate all the content that they needed to make it look good. And I think we did that with a couple things. We yeah. went through several iterations with rocks, like especially on Pandora, where we had like Portress had to make like four different versions of rocks. Uh, before uh, we landed on the ones that like felt like Pandora, because we were looking at, I'm probably getting too in the weeds here, but we were looking at like Western United States like rock formations, and we would, you know, we would sculpt those out and they would look awesome, and then we put them in the game and we we're like, oh, this actually doesn't really feel like Pandora, yeah, for some reason, and like for a while we just didn't realize that it's because we're not using the same kind of tones and the same kind of shapes. So what we ended up having to do is just evolve a lot of our older content to hit that feel. Okay. It's a lot of references to go from as well, two entire games, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. We, we had a lot of stuff to look at. Yeah. Cool. All right. All right. A uh, little brief riff on uh, the glory of uh, Blue Utilities. Um, so like I said, we were on 420, um, and uh, Blue utilities are really starting to come online during game dev for us. And we have a group uh, called Editor Test Engineers, ETEs, and they do a lot of our uh, automated build testing, a lot of our performance testing. Um, they really focus on, on ways that we can automate performance in, in QA processes. And um, they started messing around with Blue Utilities, and they created this one that our, our level design teams use a lot, and it's called the Level Fixer. Um, you know the game dev process is three, four years long. We're we're building the bicycle as we're learning how to ride the bicycle. Uh -huh. uh, so cruft builds up, um, and in situations like this, you know we would end up with, you know, we would you know make some you know stacks of crates and some stuff like that, and then you know eventually we'd be like, you know what, uh, we need it to be a physics destructible asset, not a, a static mesh. It just looks better, and you end up in circumstances like this where it's like. Hey, in that little art vignette that was over there, all of them are fine except uh, this one ended up being a static mesh instead of a physics destructible. This one ended up, you know, one of these. Um, you know, you end up with you know inconsistencies. Uh, in the old way, you'd either have to rely on like the level designer, or the level artist is going to like manually come through the level and find them all, um, or QA is going to have to find them all. And the bigger and bigger the game gets, it's impossible to QA yeah. it like that anymore. Uh, so they started to create this tool. Uh, so I'll open my Blue Utility shelf, and I will open up the Blue Utility. Uh, so this is our map fixer, and basically it contains a lot of common things that started to crop up, and we just sort of grew it over time, um, where if we have an, a, a persistent issue um, and we can solve it with a Blue Utility, we would just sort of like layer it onto this. So it uh, solves a lot of our, our kind of basic stuff where it's like, uh, you see black fog. Uh, we use lots of black fog planes as uh, spawners, um, but um, 
they need to have translucency sorting set in the right way or else like you end up with like weird ghosting stuff that happens behind them. Uh, so I could go in and I could audit the translucency sorting. Uh, it'll fill out uh, an array, uh, and then if I want to fix them, I can fix them. But we separate auditing and fixing because sometimes we're doing it intentionally. We don't want to like bash that. So uh, in this case, um, we have these physics destructibles. So I'll audit destructibles, um, and then I'm gonna close that. You'll see in the output log. Uh, whoa. So much stuff has happened in the output log. It's mounting a lot of plugins. Yeah. Uh, I get a map fixer notification. Um, hey, um, it'll either say that uh, all identified bad destructibles have been added to the, the audit list, or it'll say, hey, it was clean, didn't find anything. And now when I'm in here, this auditing list gets propagated. And it's like, hey, I found a cinder block pallet and a wood block and a, a wood plank trash can um, that were the wrong static mesh versions. And all this is really doing underneath the hood is it's basically just using um, a, a map asset to look at things that we know we have replaced. Um, because we can't just do a normal, it's not a static mesh anymore. I can't just say, hey, replace all this static mesh instance with mm -hmm. a different thing. I'm replacing it with a totally different actor class. So uh, they just sort of build up this map of known destructibles, known cloth uh, tarps that we made static mesh versions of, and then we made cloth actor versions of them. Um, and it'll just go through that, identify all of them, and then if I want to fix them, I can say, great, uh, go ahead and replace audited actors. Uh, it'll clear the list, and now when I come through, uh, all these things are going to be uh, physics destructibles now. Uh, so it's just a really wonderful way of, again, just like, you know, end of project work. We're just trying to make sure everything's as clean as possible. Uh, throw some grenades in there. You got infinite grenades? Uh, no, but I can just keep balancing myself and just throw more grenades in there. Uh, so now all the bad offending actors have been replaced, and you know those bad wood planks are, are good to go. Um, you know, and like I said, this was one of those tools that started out with them just trying to solve a couple little things, and then the mm -hmm. level design team could sort of go to them and say, like, actually, we're running into these two or three issues, um, especially for really pernicious things where like it's just this one data value that's stored you know, on an actor instance over here. And like, you'd have to know to go click every version of that actor instance and go click that individual data value um, to, to make sure you're, you're being, you know, on the bar. Um, things like, we set region balance across the world. So it's like the entire world may be balanced to Pandora, late stage Pandora, uh, but one loot chest over here may be set to early game Pandora. So like it's spawning loot that's like level two or three instead of level that's like 25, 28. Uh -huh. Um, so like little itty bitty details like that get caught like this. Um, so big fan of blue utilities. Um, you know, if you're not used to uh, working with them, um, you know, nothing complex. You know, very well organized. I'm very proud of the ETs for doing this. Um, but you know, like all this is really doing is it's going through. It's going to discover a bunch of things that we're looking for. Um, you know, it's going to make. It's just going to run through that. And make sure. We have a white list, so we can say, hey, actually ignore these certain things because they're special for whatever reason. Uh, go through, scrub out everything that's on the white list. Um, you know, go look up uh, in these uh, class maps um, what the, the destructible version of that static mesh is. Uh, go propagate them to that uh, internal audit list. Uh, and then that way, you can actually audit multiple things at the same time, fill it all up, click it. It can clean up 10 different types of bugs for you in a level in seconds. Um, and again, that's just like good sanity check. <laughs> good, uh, you know your map's clean now. Uh, it didn't take you all day. It took you, you know, five seconds to open the uh -huh. tool and run the thing. Um, you know, those are wonderful speed and efficiency gains. Uh, Do you keep a very uh, strict rule on naming conventions then, considering that that map would have to be otherwise like automatically changed based off if someone changed the name on an asset? Um, somewhat folder structure wise, and then it, it, it's sort of a, they, they try to hit the known offenders most often. Okay. Um, we we do have naming conventions. I can't say that we're the strictest people in the world in terms of naming conviction. Um, but uh, generally, uh, yeah, like we're, we're trying not to go too far off base. And if it does, somebody will go and, and, and name it. Usually the redirectors will catch that sort of thing. Something yeah. does get named wrong as long as it's in there. If it did get renamed, like the redirector will catch it usually. Yeah, we do a lot of uh, asset auditing too, uh, just after things get checked in. Like every 
Is it like every night, like the uh, the auto audit runs? Yeah. yeah. So and that'll that'll sort of go through and scrub things that like we have known rule sets for, and we have hundreds of rule sets for. It's like okay, you named this thing wrong, or it's in the wrong folder, or this is referencing something mm -hmm. that's not supposed to be referenced. Um, you know, all kinds of things. This has a dead mission objective reference that got deleted in the game. Go go clean it up. Um, so sometimes sometimes you'll come in and you'll have like. 200 auto audits because <laughs> <laughs> something you did broke a lot of stuff. Is that a middleware tool or? Did no, it's just um, it, it's part of our uh, some of what those ETs were doing, some of what mm -hmm. our release engineers were doing, um, and basically what on it's exposed to us as collections where we can basically uh, auto audits kind of have uh, collections associated with them, so we can uh, whitelist and blacklist uh, certain assets uh, based on adding them to, to those collections. Okay, um, but it's just sort of about like anything that you can define an actual rule set around, so there's no like human error to it. It's just, hey, if we said static meshes can not have more than X amount of verts, like you can make a rule around that in an auto audit will trip. And some of the auto audits just give you a warning, so then we'll legitimately, uh, we use Jira, so it'll legitimately stick a Jira bug in and say, hey, this thing was non-conforming. Um, you know, things like uh, our developer folder, you know, if there's a reference to an asset in the developer folder, it will spit you a warning and say, hey, your map is referencing to this. Um, fix your broken link. The, um, yeah, yeah, go ahead. So this is what I was talking about earlier. Uh, this is uh, one of the things our uh, team at uh, uh, GSQ, Gearbox Studio Quebec, ended up making. Um, as they started to do analysis on the sorts of environments that we end up building a lot and how we can sort of rapid prototype maps. So uh, they built out this uh, prototype blocker and basically, they looked at how uh, standard sorts of things that we do in the game. So level intro areas. When you come into the air, when you come into most maps, there's sort of a lobby. Uh, there's a safe space. There's some spawning. There's some vending machines and some ammo crates. Usually, it's usually where we can do some light narrative when you're coming to the level. Um, so they went through and they actually kind of figured out good ranges for most of these things. Uh, so level intros, transitions, standard combat areas, combats with progression, wildlife combat areas, vehicle areas. And you can just come in here and say, you know what, I want to make a transition area. Uh, and then that transition area is going to go to um, you know, a standard combat with a progression. And then you know, maybe I'm going to have another transition area come off of that. You know. And this is all based on sort of previous gameplay design and, and feedback, right? Yeah, um, literally they went through after the game shipped and they went through every single map and they sort of took measurements for a bunch of different stuff. So this is something they've, uh, they started deploying during DLC development and we've sort of started to use internally too. And it's just sort of a, you know, it's a ballpark. Like yeah. it's not meant to be like super rigid, but you can definitely quickly sort of lay out a top down for your level, you know, if you kind of know that... Uh, you know, we're going to go into a vehicle combat zone. You know, like, vehicle combat zone's big. Yeah. Um, so it's really handy for just sort of, you know, rapid prototyping. Yeah, it will save a lot of time when the artists go in too, right? Because they have to redo less work eventually because the space has already sort of been um, set up to be the right size. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's, that's really nice. It's very, it seems like a pretty simple tool to build as well, right? It's all Yeah, methods. and again, like, this is, this is just doing uh, real simple math on construction. It's just taking these sorts of presets... Um, you know, and uh, depending on you know what you're trying to do, you know, it's just going to take your mesh, which in this case we're just using a cube. Um, you know, we have some basic material parameters in here, so we can change the colors of it. So if you need to get contrast for whatever reason, you want to make your wall red or, or yellow or whatever, you can do that. Um, you know, you can if you don't want it to have collision for whatever reason, you can do that sorts of stuff. So it's just going through there and saying, okay, based upon these preset grid sizes, take that cube, you know, lay it out, you know your dynamic material instances and set scalars based upon um, preset types. So super simple, super clean, but you know it's not always the most expensive thing in the world uh, that actually gets you like huge uh, just time savings in terms of rapid prototyping. Uh, just really simple, thoughtful tools uh, can go a really long way. Uh, all right, so those are my little and how we um, do a couple different things within it. Um, and then with the rest of the time that I had, I kind of wanted to walk through how we think about the mission system. For a lot of the missions that we end up giving that are side missions in the game, uh, we give them through these uh, wanted posters. Uh, and this is a, a very quick recreation of what the initial prototype for this sort of looked like. Um, you know, we had the idea, we knew it was going to be this poster, we knew it was going to fold up. Um, 
you know, before we went very far with feature development at all, it was just, okay, how can we quickly make this work? How can we quickly make a little thing that answers the who, what, where, how, and why? Um, so, you know, it's not doing much stuff other than, you know, this is built out of cubes and, and a sphere and a text uh, component mm -hmm. and a skeletal mesh with a really crappy simple texture on it, but, you know, and a box component to handle uh, switching between the exclamation mark and the hologram. Um, the reason we prototype quickly is it allows us to, to get it in front of as many people as possible. So the art team, before they spent a lick of time actually going and building the skeleton mesh for that wanted poster, um, they could be confident that this was going to work. We could give it to the level designers. They could propagate it in their levels. We could give it to the mission designers and get their kind of wish list about usability features and stuff like that. You know, but when you look at what a prototype looks like versus a shipping asset, you know, it's not much. It's simple logic. It's just sort of answering, again, the kind of key questions about, okay, the player's going to be nearby. Uh, what's it going to look like? Um, and this is just some custom uh, blueprint that we ended up making that changes uh, switches uh, in, in bodies. Um, you know, when the player walks away, what are we going to do? When the player uses the poster, what are we going to need to do? You know, nothing, nothing sexy, nothing crazy. Uh, I will note, because um, I see this a lot in student projects, um, uh, I'm very much a believer of don't build blueprints off of actor. <laughs> so we make a prototype actor class, and that allows us to sort of consolidate things that are prototypes into a clean class over here. Um, so we can kind of track down all the sort of nascent blueprint that's been created on the project. Okay. When it's just like, an easy way to find them all. Yeah, when it's like one or two people, it's easy to track down all your blueprint. When you have 400, 500 people on your team, like it's insanity to try to track down. And that way we sort of know that all the prototypes live over here. We can kind of cauterize them or we can create an audit. Uh, so it's like how many prototype actors are your levels referencing. We can kind of clean those up and make sure they got replaced with the real things or got upgraded. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, the good thing about our process is we sort of take this prototype, we sort of take it through all the core stakeholders, um, and one of the things that we end up a lot dealing with a lot of edge cases is um, uh, simple things like touch and untouch, uh, which when you're in a single player local game, it's pretty easy because you can't break that very much. When you're in a split screen co-op game or a network replicated environment, a simple thing like touch untouch creates a ton yep. of edge cases because we deal with cable pulls. So a player got in here and then they pulled their Xbox cable, so they got disconnected from the game, or a network cable got disconnected, or they just lag spiked for whatever reason. Um, it's not always as simple. Sometimes we have player skills that allow you to teleport. So you touched it, but you teleported back out and didn't actually register an untouch event because you, you technically your physics didn't drive through the, the touch. When you say touch and untouch, do you mean um, on begin and on end overlap? Yeah, sorry, yeah. on on in, yeah, so on overlap. So it's, it's things like that where it's like, okay, a player's in a vehicle, the vehicle went through it, but the player's pawn was in the seat that didn't go through uh -huh. it, does that need to trigger? Uh, for us, we have Iron Bear, so Moe's gets wrapped up in Iron Bear. Iron Bear touched it, but Moe's is inside there, does that count? Um, so those are the sorts of things where we know the intent behind it, and we can just work with the code team directly to say, hey, we want to do this. Let's just handle that in code, because code is going to be able to handle all those edge cases a lot more. We also knew that this mesh was going to be a skeletal mesh, and the hologram was going to be a skeletal mesh. And we have a lot of skeletal meshes in our game. Uh, most of the lootables are skeletal mesh. A lot of the doors, uh, a lot of the spawns, uh, spawn doors that people come out of are skeletal meshes. So we put a really high premium on um, efficient management of skeletal mesh ticking because with so many lootables populating the area, it can get real expensive. So right. we try to hedge towards being very, very efficient, only letting them tick when they need to. So that was another sort of thing where it's like, well, we can just push that into the code class and let code manage that efficiently and in a standard way that I'm not trying to guess at because they can just, you, you know, I'm not trying to emulate what they're doing other places. So our shipping version of it looks very similar. It's just a little bit more complex. We ended up with a larger um, kind of proximity uh, box around it. Uh, we end up creating a smaller box around it to help with usability. So this um, uh, interior box, it's a little hard to see, but there's a smaller box that's sort of uh, around the edge of it. So basically it just helps with the touch trace uh, um, as people want to uh, use it. Um, you know, and again, uh, you know, we moved from you know just a text component to an actual uh, particle actor, and the particle um, is actually parameterized. So um, let's see which of these particles is the projector one. So the projector one um, 
is one singular particle that has the projector and the text in it, and the text is just parameterized out of it. So we don't have to keep making a different iteration if a mission designer wants to do something. Um, through this process, we also decided we didn't actually want to subclass this. We actually just wanted one class of wanted poster, and everything else is just handled in data. Um, I'm a huge fan of data assets. Uh, they make your life so much easier. Uh, again, in big projects, Blueprint can really spin out of control if you have a lot of repetitive Blueprint, a lot of logic living in, in hundreds and thousands of different places. Mm -hmm. So we didn't want to do that because we knew we would end up with 25, 26 you know, wanted poster subclasses that could have potentiality for some little logic hidden here and there. We have to go track it down. So instead, uh, we just provide everything that we need inside of a data asset. Um, and this is great because now for my mission designers, when they want to use a wanted poster for their mission, this is basically just a couple questions that they have to understand. They need to understand uh, what's going to show up uh, in the hologram. So we, we ask them, like, okay, what skeletal mesh are you going to use? Which forces them to think about what skeletal meshes do you have loaded in your map? So you don't want to you don't want to bring in a unique mesh usually that's only going to be one used here. So. If you're going to go fight a skag, make sure your skag's already in the map. If you're going to go fight Dave, make sure Dave's mesh is already in the map. Uh, we let them sort of uh, set an ambient uh, idle animation, so usually anything out of this skeletal's uh, suite that we kind of know is in memory already, it's usually like a breathing idle or a walk, like this guy's is walking. Um, and we use these uh, gestalt parts, which if I look at one of our skeletal meshes, we try to keep all of the various parts of a skag you know, mesh in his mesh. Uh, I think it's in the window. You're looking for the Gestalt editor, right? Yeah. Gestalt part selector. There it is. Under recording settings. Um, so all the different parts that can be on that mesh are actually just physically inside that mesh. We're not adding extra mesh components to it. And then basically we just provide uh, a parts list that says, hey, for this wanted, for this skag that I'm going to use over here, just use this list of uh, parts. So I just want the body and these certain sets of horns that are in it. Usually this is great because the wanted posters are usually like, you're going to kill Dave or you're going to go kill this gag. Mm -hmm. So usually the creature team has already set up a gestalt list for that creature and you can just recycle it because uh, it's already in memory. Um, so it's super simple and that way again, I'm not relying, the mission designer doesn't have to write any additional logic, nobody has to be trapped by it. It's literally, if you can name what you want the hologram to be, uh, and what mission you want to give, and if there's an alternate mission point. Some of our missions allow you to enter a mission at the beginning or midway through, so if you have an alternate entry point, you can provide that. Uh, but you only really need to answer a couple questions up front just to make it work. Um, and then again, I can come in here and say, okay, I actually want this to say bounty, and then I'll just reconstruct that, and bounty will show up, or I want it to be save. I can reconstruct that and just say save. So again, just, again, focus focus on flexibility. We want people to sort of be able to jump in and say, hey, I want to use a, a mission wanted poster. Great. Five minutes later, they've set up their data asset, they've plugged it in, they're done. Uh, they don't have to worry about it. If I get a bug in ever, um, you know, is it happening everywhere? Nope. Okay, it's in the data asset. Yeah. Um, if, is it happening everywhere? Cool, it's in the blueprint. Uh, it's very easy to, to kind of triage bugs that come in. Um, yeah, so that's the sort of, I, I like using this example because it's a good I think sometimes developers have a, a hard time understanding like where a where a prototype needs to end <laughs> and where you just need to bring other people in and talk to code and and what a fully featured shipping thing looks like, um, you know. And you can tell like big qual qualitative difference um, of what we're getting here, but they're both on a simple level. This is really not answering anything new um, that this prototype didn't answer. Um, it just sort of does more edge case checking than anything else. Um, so, let me open it up real quick. Um, as I get into the mission system, uh, one of the things uh, that sort of did change is when you use a wanted poster, all it's actually trying to do is it, it gives you the mission delivery placard. It gives you the UI that says, hey, do you want this mission or not? And then technically, when you accept the mission, uh, we do a filtered event on our mission system and says, okay, uh, if you've accepted it, now we're going to move on um, and either uh, accept the poster, which basically causes it to roll up, um, or if you didn't choose to do it, um, you know, it'll stay in, in idle forever. Um, but it's really not, um, there's, a, there's a layer of uh, extrapolation between 
us offering you the mission and you actually accepting the mission. Um, and that's sort of the, one of the big differences between the prototype and this one. Because our mission system is the nervous system of the game. So This is really cool. Yeah, this is, um, uh, our, our tools team built this just out of uh, like custom blueprint. Um, but this is basically the mission graph for the game. Um, so the main mission lines there through the middle. Um, and all we're really defining is just linkages. Um, main missions always unlock the next mission. Um, so we provide what the next mission in the chain is going to be, but then they will also unlock other missions to be av available to be given to the player. So those wanted posters become active, or mm -hmm. mission NPCs will now have an exclamation mark above their head. Um, so this allows us, as logically and cleanly as possible, to actually understand um, inherency in the mission system. Um, and this is really where, where I say it is the nervous system. Uh, everything in the game that takes mission state is, is taking it from this graph or the subgraphs that are inside of a mission. Um, and everything is just sort of you know dependent on the state of uh, different objectives and then when a mission is completed or failed or whatever. So the poster is actually reacting to the mission going into an accepted state versus a, a not accepted state um, instead of the use prompt causing it to move forward. Um, so there's always a little bit of logical thought we have to put towards like how do things listen to the mission mm -hmm. system. Um, but the nice thing is it's very deterministic. Uh, you can kind of understand um, state flow from point A to point B through it. And then uh, I built a little sample mission for this um, just to sort of walk through some of uh, how we can think about it. But we want our mission designers to be able to prototype quickly. Uh, we've now got them like embedded in rooms with the level designers and level artists so everybody can just think about building a mission in a space together. Uh, so we want people to be able to act rapidly. So like I built this mission uh, yesterday before we, we flew out. Um, great, I accept my epic test mission. <laughs> Me accepting it causes uh, this uh, wanted poster interactive object to change its state. And a lot of things that you see in the world, they're all simple state machines. And if I say interactive objects or IOs, it's because they're very simple state machines. The wanted, uh, the loot chests are state machines. They're closed, they're opening, they're opened, they're locked. Um, doors are closed or opening, opening, locked. Uh, switches are on, off. Um, you know, lots of state machines. So in this case, you know, I provide, um, you know, I, s I had one objective there for like, hey, go over to the bandit camp. Uh, in this case, my little switch now has an objective for it for me to use the switch. When I use the switch, it pushes the mission forward, which allows the door to say, okay, we've moved forward. And I'll, I'll walk through that logic in a second. And then this is just sort of using um, GSQ's, uh, you know, block out tool to define, um, you know, basic combat ranges and stuff like that. You know, so this would allow me to take a, a mission prototype very quickly and explain to a level designer or a level artist or another mission designer like what my intent was. Like, mm -hmm. if I want to walk through, you know, the scary banded canyon and then I want to get to the effigy and then I need to turn on all the gas lines for the effigy. So, uh, you know, I can turn it on. We can, we can burn Mr. Effigy Man over there. You know, and then once we've done the effigy, it'll summon the, the fire boss. give myself a gun to fight back. And I'm going to kill the fire boss, but I'm just going to kill enemies. I kill the fire boss. Fire boss had a MacGuffin inside of him. I pick up the MacGuffin and I completed my mission. Nice. Um, Good job. So, you know, this is a very, you know, I'd call this boilerplate. This is a lot of when I have uh, new designers come in and work on missions, I have to work on missions like this. It's a looter shooter. So mm -hmm. this is focused on some very just core competencies about like, you need to shoot some things, you need to loot some things, you need to use some things. Um, but, you know, like I said, everything is meant to be responding to that nervous system of the mission system. So we try to understand what are the most common things we're doing on missions and build code paths and blueprint paths for them so that people can just work quickly and they don't have to write a lot of custom uh, script on their own. So if I actually look at the level blueprint for this level, um, I think the only, th yeah, there's, I, I put a debug event in here to put me in de uh, demigod so I don't dive on, die on the live stream. But other than that, um, there's, no, there's no blueprint in here. I didn't have to actually do any scripting in the level because I'm just using core classes and again, common boilerplate stuff to just make my life easy. So we have a traditional waypoint actor um, where all we really have to define is, um, in this case, a mission conditional. So we can set a mission conditional on this icon so that it's, it's active. Um, and basically I can define, 
hey, in my mission on the objective to go to the COV camp, and I want it to be active when that objective is active, because clearly that's what's driving me over there. And then when the player touches it, um, I want to send an event back to my mission. Oh, I clicked a thing. It's going to propagate that. Oh, it's going to go through all the mission lists. Yeah. I got a question for you. Yeah. Um, they were curious how all of that is serialized for save games. Um, that is a great question for Daniel. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, does he get sent to Spark or? No, it's all. I mean, it's all in your local save profile. I mean, that's that's why, you know, we're we're not the most authenticated game in the world. Um, I also think if you stop the mission midway, you actually have to do it from the beginning. It depends on. It's on a per objective basis. Some objectives are failable. Um, so if you come back, and I can I can sort of show you um, when we. When we have a mission objective, um, when the objective is active, uh, we filter um, off of a switch based on the different states that it can be in. So if you were, like, um, you know, active on load and we wanted you to start over, we would actually do this and we would do a thwart. We would thwart the objective okay. um, to push you back because maybe there was a narrative thing that we wanted to hit you with again. Um, you know, but, you know, sometimes we can also set an objective itself to be. Um, you know, some of them are all or nothing. So it's like, hey, you need to kick, collect ten cans, and if you only got seven of them and you left and you came back, you didn't. We didn't give you partial progress. Mm -hmm. We made you start from the beginning. Um, but we can actually come in here and we can set things to be uh, completely failable or not, uh, if if need be. So like some of the like raid bosses are are you know all or nothing. Like you have to finish the entire raid boss fight, or it's it's not like you can't come back midway through. Um, but largely, it's these sorts of things where you know, in you know, waypoints like go to waypoint, very common. You know, it's it's bread and butter. Um, so all you really have to understand is what objective you want it to be active on. And we basically wrote custom conditionals, and these are all code conditionals, just because um, if you're going to be using conditionals a lot, code-based conditionals are just faster uh, to resolve. Like you can you can prototype them in Blueprint, but get them to a coder as quickly as possible. Um, and then usually they'll slingshot mission events. Um, and we like to do it this way because it's kind of easy to trace what's happening. So for my first objective, I've only got one objective in the set, and it's go to COV camp. That event is being slingshotted from the, the waypoint actor uh, to come update the objective, and then we just automatically move on to the next objective set. Um, and this is a very simple mission, so almost all the objectives are uh, one objective, or in this case where the, I'm turning on the three valves, I have one objective that's player facing and then I have multiple invisible objectives that I'm tracing each individual valve. So if you did come back and you'd finish two of the three valves, it would remember those states individually. Okay. Um, but yeah, a lot of, as I go through these things, you know, it's the uh, same sort of thing for the switch. Um, I just need to understand, hey, I'm sending this mission event and this is when I'm properly unlocked. Uh, we do this to sort of bulletproof ourselves so that the player can't run ahead and use the switch before it's meant to be. So we don't unlock the switch until the mission condition is active for them. And then you used it, it sends the mission event, we move forward. Um, the door uh, is just listening to it. So in its case, it is a mission-driven door and it's going to open um, when this mission and the objective for open gate, which was completed by that switch sending the event, so when its status is set to complete, it'll be complete. When I come back in the level, the door will be open because it's already gotten that state once the mission system initializes. Um, you know, and that's sort of uh, you know what I, what I like to push with a lot of people is you want to minimize the amount of custom blueprint logic you want to be writing, especially in level blueprints, just because it's very handy and you can do a lot of stuff with it, but especially in bigger projects where you have a lot of people and a lot of hands in and out of it, you ha just have to be more careful about uh, managing all that information mm -hmm. because you know somebody can do something really well-meaning, but it's kind of hidden from you. You need to go remember to open up that submap and look at its mission blueprint and audit it. And when it's hey, it's six months to ship, we got to finish the game. Like you don't always have time to like jump into everybody's stuff constantly to sort of like audit it and clean it. Uh, and it's also a lot easier to just go through uh, data assets. Yeah. Um, and, and and change values. You don't have to check out a map. Yeah, and that's the sort of you know like hey. If it's in this and there's a problem with that door, I don't need to jump into the map to go fix the door. I can just go fix the door individually. Or if, um, like, we end up uh, proxying doors a lot. So let me drill into some interactive objects. Um, you know, we will sometimes build a door. Uh, where's my interactive object thing? 
love doors, as everybody on my team will validate me on. So, you know, like we can give you a, a, a quick, you know, prototype door uh, that you can put in your map, and that way art team can be filling this in with the art meshes as mm -hmm. they're building it, and you don't actually have to go update your map ever. Like one day it's just gonna look beautiful because the real meshes came in. Uh, or they'll put the proxy meshes in, and you can sort of say like, hey, that's not wide enough, it's not tall enough, or whatever. It also just sort of lets us enforce standards so that we understand like Iron Bear can always fit through main, main doorway paths, and players can fit through main doorway paths and stuff like that. Um, but yeah, every single thing that you know we did in that mission, from using a switch, hitting uh, waypoint triggers, uh, using these valves, uh, even these fire effigies. Um, this is a combination of both of these approaches. This is, um, it's, a, it's another sort of interactive object class. Um, we just give it a condition for when it's extinguished. So in this case, um, I'm extinguishing it um, when this thing is complete and then I invert the condition. So it's basically the opposite of completion. Um, so it's not on until you've completed the objective and then it will turn on. Um, but these are great because this is, um, you know, if you look around a lot of Borderlands maps, you end up with, we use fire in a barrel a lot, we use flame jets coming out of things. Like we love using fire as a decorative purpose for mm -hmm. things. And even some things like, there's some like cold areas where we use like cold vents and stuff like that. So they're usually like, a couple different you know, departments involved there. There's an effects component to it, there's usually a lighting component to it, uh, there's a damage component to it, and that damage needs to be like balanced for the area that we're in. You know, it's really easy for somebody to sort of be already at a level and they just put some fire down, but now the player expects to be burned by it, so it needs all these sort of extra things. And rather than saying, no, you guys can't do that at all, we just wanted to be flexible about it. And once we could sort of say, these are the rules, this is what I can do, um, we just use data again. So in this case, um, like I just used this uh, fire spray one, but if I wanted to use uh, a car fire or, oh, I'll get to that in a second. Uh, oh God, sorry, I'm on somebody else's mouse, so I'm always, okay, I'm gonna stop doing that. Um, but basically, uh, you know, this allows us to sort of go through um, standard barrel fire, uh, large areas uh, for, um, when you go to a big uh, asteroid and fight on it, um, giant orbital thruster um, <laughs> that's functionally the same sort of thing, where you know, like, it's going to burn you, and it needs to do all these same sort of things. Yeah. It's just that in a, a macro-sized version of it. And that's just one blueprint, and then you're actually just switching data table. Yeah. Um, so all this, and again, all this is on construction. Like, not much is actually happening uh, live in it, um, but it's super handy because then. Um, we can keep all these things. Um, audio's pretty happy because they can define how the audio for this needs to work and if it needs to come over like that, you know, a tiki torch making fire, it's fine. Audio needs to come from that little spot, but like that giant orbital thruster has yeah. different audio needs. So they can come in here and they can actually set different uh, relative location overrides. Um, so they can actually extend out where audio is coming from in different ways. Um, our effects team, uh, we can keep them happy because we can actually f uh, enforce max scaling in here. So like this one, uh, you can only take it between one and it looks like 3.0 scale. So we can actually clamp it because okay. certain effects, like particles don't scale well, <laughs> you know, is sort of the, the traditional bane of a lot of effects artists. So uh, this allows us to sort of put some nice sanity clamps in. So it's like, okay, you can take this and we'll let you extrude it out a little bit, but not too much. And the VFX artist doesn't have to go and specifically have a list of like, you cannot scale these more than X. Yeah, and, and when you say like, well, you told me I could scale that one 3X, why can't I scale this one? It's like, because they're built differently. Yeah. And the art's just sort of eccentric to what it needs to be. So it allows us to put clamps in. And then if they find, you know what, that 3.0 clamp was a little too aggressive and we actually need to dial that back. They can just check out this data asset and set that to two. Yeah. Um, and the next time somebody opens their map, and if they have that data asset, it's going to reconstruct the thing, and it's going to clamp it back down to two. Um, you know, it really has been super helpful. It allows us, you know, and it does these other little things in here, like um, the damage box that the player's actually in. It allows us to actually, you know, like manipulate that on a per particle basis, so we can dial that in. So it feels like it's damaging you in a good way, but it's not cheap. Like, we just didn't put a giant box around the entire thing just to make you feel bad about yourself. Like, we, we try to hedge towards being player friendly so it's like you can get you know close to that thing and I'm not going to burn you if you're standing mm -hmm. over here um, you know and then you know again this is those sorts of things where it comes up in development we identify a problem how can we take that problem and come up with a dev tool that speeds everybody up uh, and keeps as many departments uh, happy and all sort of on the same page 
Uh, and now, you know, if you're a, a lighting artist or an environment artist and you're propagating all those fire in a barrels, you don't need to individually hand place everything. Now, again, you just take with the generic effects hazard, plug in the fire in a barrel data asset, um, and, you know, you're good to go. You know, and a lot of these, um, you know, we uh, basically just expose the ability for designers to make their own um, data assets. So I can go blueprint another one and just say, hey, I want, you know, I don't know what problem I'm trying to solve, but I'm, I'm going to need to define a static mesh and, you know, some, some transform values or whatever. Uh, uh, basically, we exposed um, data assets to be this uh, GBX data asset blueprintable. Create that guy. You know, and now when I'm in here, all I'm really doing is saying, um, yeah, sure, this is my uh, is special bool, and you know, maybe I wanted to find a static mesh. Uh, fun of propagating uh, tables at the end. Uh, static. So once we have that sort of set up, you know, if I'm in a different blueprint, just use this one as a side test, um, you know, I can define that uh, test was a stupid name. Uh, yeah, I'm not going to do that live. Uh, basically, you define your uh, blueprint instance over there. Actually, I put the other one in poster already has it exposed. Um, but we can, you know, in here, all you really end up doing is on construction, uh, you're just uh, grabbing everything that you want out of it. Uh, so in this case, uh, we are, we actually have a code version of this wanted uh, poster, uh, but we're going to cast it to a blueprinted version of it that has a couple extra variables in it. Um, it's very important when you are doing this, always do validity checks on uh, uh, data assets just to make sure that the user is actually plugging something in because otherwise uh, things can spiral off into horrific uh, directions. So well, make sure your data is valid before you start scraping from it. But then really all you're doing it is you're just grabbing all these different parameters out of it. You're just grabbing the stuff that's um, presented to you. And then from there, your blueprint or your system can go do whatever you want with uh, that information that the user is providing. Um, but you know, it's a very minimal. If people want to make blueprint data assets, um, it's very minimal code work. Um, I've seen like most of the frameworks there, like literally uncommented in a couple lines. Uh, if you go look for the data asset class, most of it's very much there. I've seen really good tutorial articles on uh, tutorial YouTube videos where people have been doing the work. Um, super handy, uh, and it, it's sort of when I talk with a lot of uh, college students and uh, indie dev projects recently, it's the, my my big advocacy is okay. Like blueprint is great, but keep it to these sort of core classes and av avoid just trying to always constantly sub instance over and over and over and over again and s really see how much you can take data out for a spin. Um, it helps with reusability, it helps with performance, it helps with just, like I said, like on bigger projects, the more and more people you have onboarding. Yeah. Um, you know, if you can avoid the sort of like hidden esoteric knowledge, like, oh, when you make your new blueprint, you need to remember to do these 15 things in your child class for it to work properly versus hey, cool, if you want to make a new wanted poster, uh, you just need to tell me these six pieces of information, and you're good to go, and you can feed yourself. Um, you know, especially with us having another studio in a different time zone in a different country, those sorts of things where we can sort of like just make speed of teaching people easier because you can't just walk down the hallway to talk to somebody. It's like yeah. the tools communicate themselves, right? Yeah, and again, there's just, yeah, you end up with way less bugs at the mm -hmm. end of the day because there's no, there's no hidden blueprints spiraled through the whole project. You can just sort of... Uh, constrain the chaos <laughs> as right. best as possible <laughs> um, and just sort of uh, like I said when a bug comes in it's really easy to sanity check is it is it this one instance or is it the whole system that's awesome was that the last one of your that's that's tidbits? what I had and then I was gonna just say hey uh, go to questions yeah there are a lot of them cool. we have about 15 minutes left we're already running over to our mark but I, I want to make sure that we get to answer some of the questions that are coming there are a lot of good questions yeah um, and just feel free some of them are a little bit more general about the game per perhaps not things that you um, you guys specifically worked on 
Um, one of the main questions that came up was they, they were wondering if any of the custom tools and techniques uh, will be shared outside of Gearbox or if they're going to stay proprietary. Um, they'll stay proprietary. We like teaching the methodology, mm -hmm. but we tend to not share our, our tooling directly or our code base directly. Uh, for those of you going to GDC this year, there are uh, a lot of talks on the docket from um, uh, tech art, uh, animation, design, uh, just general art effects, uh, mm -hmm. all kinds of things. So uh, if you are at GDC, there should be a lot of good deep dive uh, information into the methodologies. Awesome. Mm -hmm. um, what was the ratio of blueprints versus C++ used in the game? Uh, I'm not a coder. Um, as much, basically I'll put it like this. If the player is doing it or if it's really frame dependent, uh, it is almost always C++ just mm -hmm. because it resolves way, way quicker. Um, the things that are more latent and the things that are more, you know, we need to build a lot of content out of it tend to be more blueprint. So things like that door is blueprint, that switch is blueprint. Uh, mm -hmm. The waypoint actor is actually uh, code. Um, so it's sort of a mix and match depending on, on what our needs are, but like everything the players do, everything the weapons do, um, it needs to be code yeah. because we want it to be They would make know, a, a, a native base possible. class and then like you were saying the data assets would be pretty much the only thing that a designer needed to edit. Yeah. So beyond uh, like adding a new component or some custom component, which was something still like not really, didn't really happen that much, the data assets were the only things that a lot of these guys would edit. Yeah. The missions are all in Blueprint. Um, a lot of individual enemy uh, behaviors are in Blueprint, uh, but the sort of like core of how enemies can work is, is code. They were asking about, um, they had quite a few questions about AI and the enemies, and, and they were curious if they were mainly using behavior trees or if you rolled your own system for that. Uh, it's kind of a hybrid. Okay. Um, we, we largely ended up rolling our own uh, uh, tech there uh, mm -hmm. just because we we end up needing to make such a volume of enemies because we don't just make a psycho, we make like 35 different types of psychos. <laughs> so yeah. It's like, Psycho Bill has like two extra behaviors that a regular psycho doesn't do and a badass needs to behave differently. So because we need things to sort of, uh, you know, scale as quickly as possible, mm -hmm. uh, we just sort of ended up needing to do our own solution. Has that been something that's been ongoing since the previous ones? Uh, kind of everything between, like after after the old generation of games, one, two, and pre-sequel, like, I mean, full reset button when we moved okay. to Unreal 4. So a lot of core systems, uh, like our skill system and attribute system, they all kind of came over. They got refactored, but they came over. Um, so uh, kind of everything was up for, up for debate uh, when we were migrating over to the new engine. Um, when it comes to nav mesh and how you're doing the pathfinding, are you using, like, the stock nav mesh, or...? Uh, we use Havoc, uh, so um, basically, let's see if I can actually find my my tiny little actor in here. Probably not. Uh, somewhere centered around here. Oh, that's a spawner. Uh, you know, basically, we end up with these um, nav mech sessions that we can uh, drag around, and these allow us to. Um, again, like more more areas that we're using data, um, different bosses have different needs to them. So certain like little itty bitty uh, you know skags that run around don't need a ton of nav mesh versus a giant spider ant that needs a lot bigger of a radius to uh -huh. walk around. Um, so we sort of define um, you know large areas um, what specific certain bosses need certain. Man, I apologize for whatever I've done to the mouse. Um, you know, certain bosses have additional stuff, but generally we can say like default large vehicle um, and save all those things into these uh, sort of nav presets. Uh, and these define, you know, basically uh, how it paints, how large the cell sizes are and stuff like that. Uh, but uh, Havoc is our, is our solution for okay. a lot of this. Um, they were uh, wondering, um, so you've been working a long time with Unreal, clearly. Um, they were wondering what some of the main changes that you've noted during during the, the last decade. Oh, man. Oh, uh, sequencer is amazing. Uh, I was formerly a cinematics director, so I lived in matinee for a good decade of my life, and a uh, sequencer is uh, everything I wanted and more. Um, the ability to like really drill down and like um, 
you know, build cinematic actors and like, you know, in this case, like I was able to build that actor and then kind of drill in and actually like get into it, each, each of its individual components and work with them individually has been such a time savings. Um, I'm not sure if I have the marketing directory in here, but basically, actually, I bet I have the cinematics directory. Yeah. yeah I'm not gonna load player character. That'll be expensive. Um, all right, I'll let that hitch for a little second as I load a Malawan soldier. <laughs> but like, we were able to like leverage that and blueprint to like basically we made all these kind of like paper dolls, as I'd call them, of common enemies and stuff like that. So it's like. Um, you know, I now I have like the Malawan soldier, and the Malawan soldier, um, you know, has his baton and his shield, and um, you know, individual particles that needed to be attached to him for a cutscene that he's in, um, and just to be able to like take that and save him. Yeah, stop grabbing components, Brian. Uh, you know, save him off so that like we could use him in a cutscene and drill into all those things and animate them and and you know do material work on them individually and just keep drilling in, like couldn't do any of that in matinee like the, it was when when all this tooling started to come online like we were like just you know i think just the little incremental changes between like 412 and 420 where mm -hmm. we ended up like every single time was like a new happy day when it's like hey we did the merge this weekend and we moved from 18 to 19 and i'm like all right what, what can i dig in and play with um we were able to do you know like our marketing team just killed it both uh, internally and, and 2ks and some of the external contractors we uh, worked with uh, because we were able to do so much like time savings work by just like making all this as user friendly as possible, and I didn't have to like teach a thousand cinematic uh, people how to like build this Malawan soldier. Uh -huh. like, no, he's just he's just pre built. And it's all default sequencer. Uh, yeah, we we did a little bit um, just because where where we were before we uh, stopped taking merges, uh, we did a little bit of custom stuff uh, for replication, uh, just to make the replication uh, work uh, a little uh, more seamlessly. There have been quite a few questions sort of around the networking portion. I think one of the general ones was in the uh, vein of like how often when you as a designer or one of your designers on the team set out to build anything that is interactive in the game, it should work for several players. Um, do you, when you start that work, do you set it out with uh, networking in mind or do you let the designer sort of create it and then? Um, it sort of depends on what you're working with. If you're working with an enemy, um, the server, the server has authority there, and, mm -hmm. and how projectiles are being spawned are, are usually server. Server has total authority over what's happening. Um, when we have other things like you know doors and scripted things that are working, uh, like I said, these things are state machines uh, fundamentally. Like we call them interactive objects, and uh, they they come pre-built with a number of states in them. So uh, let's see if I can come down here. So like. There's a default set of like enable, enabling default, you know, locked, um, and whether it's interactive or not, that are just sort of pre-baked in them. They're just enumerated states. Um, the the niceness from that is that we end up um, the state change is replicated, so we have a lot of um, things that happen where you know a state is going to change, and we know that that event is replicated to everybody, but everything that happens after the event is all client driven. So the fact that that door was told to open is sent to all of us, mm -hmm. but the actual it moving is all on each of our clients. Uh, and that way we're not just constantly pushing things down the pipe to people. So there's little efficiency savings like that uh, that really go a long way. Um, like I said, like the, the little sort of custom stuff we did around sequencer was, so there's a heartbeat replication going on so that it's not necessarily replicating every frame to every certain person, mm -hmm. but it's sort of saying like, hey, I'm at one second. I'm at two seconds, I'm at three seconds. And that way, if you had a lag spike, you would just sort of sync up, sync up yeah. eventually. Um, so try to be efficient about what we send down the pipe. I'm going to try to pick some of the good questions here out of, out of the ones we have left. Um, I thought this one was pretty cool. Did you adopt some uh, location and art style from, from like a real world uh, culture or mythology? Um, they. We have a huge team of concept artists and who pulled influence from all over the place. We have like libraries of classic art books, other games art books, uh, uh, just like geographical like picture books, uh, a huge reference library. And these guys are so creative when they uh, 
when they pull these art books down and get inspired by them. So I don't, there's nothing off the top of my head that is like, oh, this is absolutely like where we drew our influence. But you can see uh, through some of like the planets and stuff like Promethea, for instance, where a lot of our artists would draw inspiration from. Like there's a little bit of Akira in there, there's uh, Blade Runner in there with like the orange fog. Uh -huh. We would look at movies and we'd be like, that is amazing. Like what if we, like what would our spin on that be? So it's not just geographical stuff that we draw influence from. Like, yeah, we'll look for that for reference for like biomes and things like that. But we'll also look at like some of our favorite movies and kind of create like big hodgepodges of uh, yeah. of, of of biome sets. We call it we all, we call it all the pla planets biome. So like we have like the city biome and Eden biome and the necro biome and all that stuff. And, yeah. and so much of our aesthetic is literally about like jamming things into other things mm -hmm. <laughs> so even when it comes to like biome concepting right. it's it's usually never like that one place was rad or that one country has cool architecture it's like yeah we like the light sconces off that thing but we like right. the tile work on the roof of this other thing it, it was also tough too because we know how to we know how to make pandora we've, yeah we've been there so many times like for three games and so when we were like all right we're going to go to different planets it became a question of how do we get the feel of Borderlands, which is like these big chunky reeds and, and kind of like attaching trash together to like make it look like it's usable, you know, like it's, it's like backyard sci-fi. Uh -huh. Put well, some rebar on that. Yeah. It's Pandora. Uh, how do we get that feel in these other planets? And that was a huge challenge for the art team, but I think they nailed it. They did such a good job. I'm always like in awe when I play the game and see like how our level artists like mash things together and uh, all the source art that our content art team makes is just always so cool. Like looking at individual assets and seeing how they like ink everything by hand and on all the work that goes into the color choices and, and the form reads, it, it's, it's awe-inspiring, jaw-dropping. Like those guys are so pro at this. I just realized that I didn't mention that we had keys for the stream. Surprise! Surprise! If you've been sticking around for this long, um, <laughs> that <laughs> your odds just—I was up. so excited about the technology that I forgot about the actual game. Um, let's figure out what to do with them after, because we literally have like less than five minutes left of the stream. So that would be an interesting. We we <laughs> we will figure out what we're going to do with these keys. They're <laughs> not going to stay here. <laughs> we already have the game. Um, so we're going to figure out what to do with them. But uh, Gearbox was kind enough to, uh, to give us 10 keys for, for Twitch and YouTube. So we're going we're gonna to figure out what to do with them. Uh, actually, I have an idea. Why don't you go ahead and fill out the survey uh, that I believe Amanda linked in chat earlier. Uh, maybe we can link it again. And if you put your email in there, um, rather than just a t-shirt, we usually give out one t-shirt for everyone who fills out the survey, we can split out the, um, the 20 Borderlands codes um, for the game on, on Epic Game Store. Does that sound good? Yep. Cool. Sounds good to me. Yeah, let's do that. So if you didn't catch that, fill out the survey. Uh, let us know what you thought of the stream today and what we'd like to see in the future. Let these guys know how awesome they were doing on stream, because I think they've been doing absolutely fantastic. Thanks. Um, and then we will um, go ahead and, and pick some, some lucky winners off of those emails and hand out the keys. Yay, solutions. Um, let's see. If there was, I think I have one last question, um, and then we're going to wrap this up. Uh, let's see. There's a long list of questions here. Um, what mistakes were the most costly in Blueprint design work over the course of the project? Does any particular issue, such, such as repeated errors, etc., stand out? Um, the the biggest problem was scope. Um, you know, in a great way, everybody wanted to jump into the engine and start making stuff, and Blueprint lets you jump into the engine and start making stuff. Um, wrangling the scope down. Um, seeing how much we could actually like convert back down to standard processes. Uh, like I said, it's you're you're building the bike as you're learning how to ride mm -hmm. the bike, and uh, you know some things don't always work. So I think that's one of our you know that's one of our number one targets is um, reducing the need for it in a lot of places and just reducing the the just pure volume of it because um, a lot of it can end up living in data or it can live in data only blueprints or it can live in a lot of other different formats. Um, and now we, we know what we know, and uh, it lets us avoid the error the second time, hopefully. That sounds pretty good. Um, Chad was mentioning earlier that um, how to get a job at, as an FX artist at Gearbox, 95% fire portfolio. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> fire and explosions. Yeah. And the sassy, sassy dialogue lines and, <laughs> yeah, all, <laughs> yeah, all the fun stuff. That's great. 
Um, thank you so much for coming out to HQ, spending all the time preparing this this content for us. I like the little um, special, the little sign you did yeah. for, for for your level. Yeah. Um, best best thing you can ever do is uh, bribe an artist into making you a fully inked uh, lettering set uh, because marketing will pay for it eventually. Uh, you get a, <laughs> you get a lot of usage out of uh, letters yeah. uh, in the Borderlands style. Yeah, thank you so much for having us. Yeah, uh, Shane, of course. It was really fun. Uh, shout out to everyone back at Gearbox. You guys are awesome. Love yeah, some of them were in chat, actually. Yeah. Oh, yeah? Yeah, yeah. yeah, there were some developers chat. Uh, thank you for yeah. stalking us. Answering questions. We'll see you tomorrow. <laughs> They'll be back later tonight. Um, for all of you who are joining us again and you usually watch the stream, thank you for watching. As always, I'd like to leave a little bit of a couple notes about what happens in our community. Um, if you haven't checked out our Meetup page, go ahead and do so at unrealengine.com slash user dash groups. Groups, not groups user dash groups. Uh, there might be a meetup near you in case you'd like to visit, um, you know, meet with like-minded people who are working with the tools. It doesn't matter if you're new to the engine or not, that we all love to share. Um, as, as we can tell here, even Gearbox is coming out to sharing some of the knowledge with us. Um, go ahead and check that out. If there are no meetup groups in your area and you are curious about what it would take to um, start one, go ahead and send an email to community at unrealengine.com and we'll let you know what that includes. Um, as well, make sure you check out our forums. That's where we look at new release projects, what's work in progress, any issues you might have. Make sure you use the feedback form there as well for us if there's anything you'd like to see um, to happen with the engine. Um, as always, make sure you send us and let us know about your projects so that we can spotlight them at the beginning of the stream. And if you stream on Twitch, make sure you use the Unreal Engine category so that we can tune in whenever you're doing so. I try to follow as much as possible. And uh, big special thanks to, uh, to you guys as well as the rest of Gearbox who let you actually come out here uh, yeah. and show off all of these, these amazing tools. Uh, next week on the stream, I haven't announced this yet, but I'm going to announce it right now. We're actually going to be doing a Blender to Unreal stream with a little bit of a special surprise for you there. We got something cooking internally that we're, um, that we're planning to release. So next week, we'll be doing um, a little bit of Blender uh, with Kay and James here in the studio. And I think with that, it's this is the literally the longest stream I've ever done since I started here. Yay. So I think Pure gives volume. us all yeah. a good couple of knuckles. And with that said, I hope you all have a rest fantastic week. And I'll see you all next week. Bye, everyone.